we go into open before we start our discussion with Dr. Glazer, I, I'd like to make a little statement. Um, and, and I'm going to read this prepared statement because um, it's, it's rather upsetting to me. It is with heartfelt sadness that I advise you of the passing of Dr. James Fadul. Dr. Fadul was our superintendent for 18 years in Nutley. I served most of those years with Dr. Fadul. He passed away peacefully at his home with his loving wife, June, at his side. He was a graduate of Bethlehem Liberty High School and Lafayette College, where he earned a bachelor's degree in history and mathematics. He earned a master's degree in history and education and a doctoral degree in education administration from Lehigh University. Dr. Fadul retired as superintendent of schools from the Nutley School District in 1996 after serving for 18 years. As an educator and while serving Nutley, he received numerous accolades, including a ceremony attended by New Jersey Education Commissioner Saul Cooperman, crediting him with graduating some of the brightest students in the country who regularly attended colleges such as Yale, Duke, and Princeton. He was recognized for his outstanding and individual contributions to education by both members of the state of New Jersey legislature and the U.S. Congress. Dr. Fadul was, was a, a true mentor of mine, an outstanding superintendent, an outstanding caring person. I, I would only joke, and there's probably only one person, maybe two people, uh, that would realize, but him and Carmen Recchio now are having some good discussions up in heaven. Um, if anybody would like to say something, Mr. Scalera, now's your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Skinsky. I love Dr. Fabul. Uh, as you know, we've had many lunches with him and Carmen all over the place. Um, he was a true educator, did a great job in this town. It was a sad day he left. Um, I'm sorry he's passed on, but um, he will never ever be replicated for the work he was able to do. Thank you. Anyone else like to say anything at this time? I just want to say he was Mr. President. He, he was an incredible, incredible leader, an incredible superintendent. He's been missed and now we'll miss him down here. Rest You're in right. peace. Yes, thank you. Um, now, Dr. Glazer, I guess we can start our discussion tonight. Um, you have the floor. Hello, everybody, again. Welcome. Um, I'm thrilled to have you back for another week. Uh, I do miss everybody. I miss seeing everybody, and at least in this way, um, I can still feel connected to the community and still make sure that we can see everybody. Um, after last week's meeting, as you know, um, we were not able to approve our um, draft restart and recovery plan to open the schools. Um, and maybe that was um, for a good thing because the very next day on August 12th, um, Governor Murphy announced that school districts that could not meet all the health, health and safety standards for safe in-person instruction were able to begin the year with 100% virtual learning. I want to assure you that our draft plan has not changed. We did have an option one, 100% 1, virtual learning, as well as an option two hybrid model, and we will be returning to that option two hybrid model. Um, our draft plan reflects all of the extensive research, all of the thorough planning that the district has done to meet the health and safety standards, to identify all of the necessary protocols, um, all of those procedures that we need to do, including um, those for hygiene and social distancing. Um, and we're still challenged under several areas under the requirements. Um, the state does require a checklist to submit our draft plan for approval, and there were several areas on that checklist under general health and safety. Um, and those that um, ensure the delivery of instruction um, and general education. Oops, could you mute if you could, please? Thank you. Um, and again, those that ensure the delivery of general, special, general and special education instruction, especially those related to services to students with disabilities. So I do want to just take a moment to say again, that the plan has not changed. And for and, and to take a minute also to thank those of you, we had about 30 community members who did send their questions and comments in advance. Thank you. We're gonna go through and answer those questions this evening. 
one of you did um, email at the beginning of the meeting and say you didn't get a response. That's because we're responding live during the meeting. But after the meeting, I'll go back and answer the emails of all 30 of you just to make sure that you get the um, information that's necessary. So you know, the plan that we developed is a really good plan. Our hybrid model um, was strong and I'm still um, committed. I believe the board is still committed to returning students to school. Part of our request to the Department of Education to start 100% virtually has a plan that does return students to school. And I do want to start off by saying, especially for the hundreds of people that have participated in the development of this plan, that we did have to give dates. We had a very short notice to give dates, and those dates were arbitrary. It was suggested to us that we use the marking periods. Um, that's why you see 7 to 12 returning November 4th and elementary returning um, December 4th because that's when their trimester ends. That does not mean that's what we're going to do. Luckily for all of us and for our task force, we have lots of time to continue to discuss that. What we didn't have lots of time to do was figure out how we could start the year with the 40 or so checklist items that the Department of Education gave to us after, to be sure that you understand that, after our draft plan was developed. So in those areas of um, ventilation and general and special education, I am gonna detail those. I'm going to answer some of the um, questions that we've already received um, in advance of the meeting. Um, we're going to hear the specific virtual learning plan, what your children would be doing, what staff would be doing, what each of us will be doing, um, just, just so everything is clear to the community and everyone else. Um, and I also want to make sure before I start going through all of the things that we requested from the Department of Education, that you understand that in a traditional school year, our buildings are adequately ventilated. This isn't a typical time. In a typical time, we're able, when the temperatures rise to 75 degrees or above, and the temperatures in our second and third floors rise to 90 and above, we're able to move classes, right? We're able to cycle them through the air conditioned spaces. We're able to combine classes. We're able to do a number of things that we are not able to do um, given the capacity requirements, given the social distancing requirements. So I do want you to understand that um, as I work through this. And I do, again, just want to reiterate that, that we're going to keep you updated on our goal to bring students back into per, in-person instruction. That hasn't changed. We just need to be able to do that when it's the most safe to, to do so. I think that I've been pretty clear since the beginning that our focus is on the health and safety of our staff and students and the classroom spaces that are occupied by our students and staff. We need to make sure when we're bringing people into these buildings that it's with proper ventilation, airflow, and social distancing. And just to give you an example, um, before I go through the request that we made to the Department of Education, our new teacher orientation started yesterday. Um, typically, people would be in the district all week. We would have all of our administrators, um, various of our uh, association members, our security team, our technology team, all working hand in hand um, with staff. Typically, it's in the middle school library because it has a big enough space. This year, um, we set up tents outside in the parking lot of the middle school. We were able to hold about 24 people um, in that space. That was enough for our new teachers. It was enough for uh, me to cycle in, some of our administrators to cycle in, and for um, Kent Bainey, our assistant superintendent, Janine Locansolo, our director of curriculum instruction and assessment, David DePisa, our business administrator, and Karen Greco, our director of communications and employee relations, to be able to cycle in. And we're doing um, that work outdoors with them, even today when it rained. Um, and the, the rest of that work is hybrid in the afternoon. You're going to hear me talk about other examples of that. We just don't have the space to do that with the entire student body and staff in an appropriate space. And again, I'm going to detail that um, right now, actually. 
Um, so the Nutley Board of Education, and I do, I'm sorry that I need to look away from the camera because I actually want to read the, the statement so that it's clear what we're talking about. Um, so I apologize that you won't see my face, but I promise I'll look back into the camera in just a second. So the Nutley Board of Education um, did make a request of the New Jersey Department of Education to permit the district to use option one of our restart and recovery plan, which is the 100% virtual instructional option for students. And as I said, um, as part of the plan, we did need to um, put in dates for our return. We listed the first marking period and first trimester um, because we needed to do that. Um, again, we can still discuss how, how students return because that is still our priority. Um, option one was detailed last week at the board meeting. That draft reopening plan was sent to all members of the community August 4th. Um, and again, the Board of Education tonight after we do the um, review of these components and Mr. Bania and Ms. Locansolo go back through the virtual learning plan, we'll have the opportunity to resolve to approve the modified plan for a phased reopening of schools and the resumption of in-person learning. And again, I'm going to repeat this, that supports a safe return of students and staff to our district school buildings. We will be taking that vote this evening. Um, again, Following are the details of the health and safety standards that are at issue. Our plan for satisfying the standards during the initial 100% virtual instruction and a timeline of anticipated dates to resume that safe in-person instruction. These are added to our draft um, restart and recovery plan and tomorrow would be submitted to the executive county superintendents to go to the Department of Education. One of the mandates of the guidance is that we ensure that indoor facilities have adequate ventilation, including maintaining operational heating and ventilation systems where appropriate, and ensuring that our recirculated air has a fresh air component. Opening windows if air conditioning is not provided, and maintaining any air filters for air conditioning units. Um, a growing number of scientists are convinced that a significant amount of the coronavirus transmission occurs through the air in indoor spaces, and that poor ventilation is what magnifies that risk. As you know, um, the governor's been pretty clear about this. He has yet to reopen restaurants. He has yet to reopen gyms. Our capacity has remained limited as well, and we need to, to use that um, research to be able to make decisions for, for the district. While there are exceptions, many of the Nutley Public Schools classrooms are not temperature regulated to produce ideal learning environments or levels of fresh air capacity for ventilation. What that means is, again, in the traditional school year, we can overcome that problem by rotating classes to air-conditioned spaces, moving classes, combining classes, working in common spaces to provide that comfortable learning environment. None of those options are available to us between the overcrowding, the reduced occupancy, and each of the social distancing expectations and guidelines. The ventilation systems, as well as the HVAC systems, struggle to provide the optimum 72 degrees learning environment. With regularity, we find that at this time of the school year, in the early fall, when outdoor temperatures rise above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, our indoor classroom conditions sometimes are in excess of 90 degrees in the following locations. And I will detail these for you. Um, I see a number of staff on this call. Um, I see our administrators on this call. And I am confident that each of them have experienced this um, in, in conditions that were less than optimal, optimal, but certainly more ideal than what we're facing in September. Those spaces... Nutley High School Annex on the second and third floor that impacts approximately 10 to 15 classrooms. The main building of Nutley High School also on the second and third floor, excluding the World Language Wing and still impacting approximately 10 to 15 additional classrooms. Our Nutley High School Science Wing, where we do have uh, mechanical issues, that um, impacts approximately eight classrooms currently. At Radcliffe School, we have approximately eight classrooms that have no air conditioning and windows that do not fully open. 
also at Radcliffe School in our, in our Applied Behavior Analysis Wing. Um, that is the, the place where we instruct um, our students on the autism spectrum. So in that ABA wing, we currently have mechanical issues. The part is on back order. Um, there are approximately five special needs rooms there um, that are impacted by that lack of air conditioning. At Yanacaw School, on the second and third floor, approximately 15 to 20 classrooms are routinely affected. At Lincoln School, we have a geothermal system. That geothermal system is terrific for regulating the temperature, but it does work with the HVAC units. And currently, one of our two HVAC units is not properly working. The part, again, because of the pandemic, is on back order. That affects approximately a third of the space at Lincoln School. Um, and you're going to hear me talk about how we'll use Lincoln School, but again, only in that third appropriate space. Um, Spring Garden School on our first and second floor, there is no air conditioning. That's where our preschool um, integrated program is located. Mo many of our special education children are therapeutic um, units. Um, as well as our um, lower grade classrooms, and that also impacts an additional 15 to 20 classrooms. So you can see, um, so far I've detailed five of our schools where we have a large number of our classrooms that are impacted by a high heat index. At the John H. Walker Middle School, the HVAC system is currently working at approximately 60% capacity. Um, there is a second compressor that needs to be replaced. We have already budgeted for that and begun that process um, at a cost of uh, about $100,000. Um, with the windows open, that further strains the HVAC system and creates that difficulty in maintaining the regulated temperature and the fresh air component, the fan component um, of recirculated air, especially in that high heat environment. The middle school um, becomes almost a, a, a null environment for us to be able to use. Um, so that's six of our seven buildings, and I'll talk about Washington School in a little bit. Um, between the lack of available ventilation on high heat days and the possibility of having to exclude this large number of instructional spaces due to the um, high heat, the resulting ventilation issues, um, social distancing, um, we cannot meet the mandate for adequate ventilation in all of our indoor facilities. Additionally, the district is, in all, is already in receipt of at least nine health requests for window air conditioning to accommodate staff and student health and safety for the 2021 school year due to these high heat conditions. That's in addition to the many other requests for accommodations for staff. Um, the claim is that certain respiratory conditions are exacerbated in students and staff in the heat. Um, window air conditioning units are not recommended um, in this COVID environment. You've heard me talk about that in pretty much every task force um, and what we need to do um, with air conditioning. When it's a room that only has air conditioning and no other window, um, we have to exclude that space because you still need the fresh air space. Um, the window air conditioning is um, also, if you can't have that fresh air flow, it says any virus that's present will be mixed into the recirculated indoor air. While the air conditioners increase the available outside air, um, the offer of fans has not been met favorably. That was the accommodation that we had um, to, to provide our district physicians and the health department. Um, we're concerned that that would not be enough, um, even facing forward, to, um, to help um, circulate that outside air. Staff and student families in the situation um, will inevitably make the choice not to return in person, um, to request that 100% virtual option. We've seen that over and over with the comments in the real-time portal. And again, even though we have not communicated to our staff at this point, other than to tell them, um, the plan last week and um, what the plan was this week, the same communication that you received, we've continued to receive requests for accommodation, staff accommodations. Um, an additional challenge of the high heat of the late summer and the early fall is that requirement that all staff and students wear face coverings. 
this is a non-negotiable. It's not only a New Jersey law, it is a policy we'll be implementing tonight unless there's a health risk. So the rising temperatures in the classrooms and buildings also mean a rising potential for heat-related illness, um, heat stroke and other illness. As the coronavirus pandemic continues, it's necessary to keep wearing masks and maintaining social distance to prevent transmission. But in those rooms that are 90 degrees and higher, it's gonna be very, very hot, difficult to keep students wearing their masks snugly over their mouth and nose. Additionally, perspiration is an issue. Um, if the mask becomes damp with sweat, the ability to screen out the coronavirus is diminished. The requirement of students and staff wearing masks compounds the inability for the district to provide an adequate learning environment consistent with temperature and ventilation mandates. While the Nutley Public Schools is actively working through problems with HVAC and air conditioning and ventilation in the buildings, as I've detailed where um, we have mechanical work in progress and work um, that resolved with back-ordered equipment, um, this further delays the return to in-person learning until cooler days later in the fall alleviate some of these significant health concerns associated with the high heat index and compounded by the capacity and social distance requirements in classrooms throughout the district. Um, so there's the ventilation issue. And, and for those of you, there were a number of um, questions about ventilation, um, mostly related to whether we had looked at HEPA filters, other filters, the addition of air conditioning and that kind of thing. Um, that's not the issue. The issue, please mute, by the way, if you're not muted, please, thank you. The issue is the high heat index and therefore um, that's why we believe we can start bringing people back into the schools as soon as there are cooler days. I just wanna repeat again that the dates in the plan are arbitrary, um, those that are November and December. The other piece of our um, checklist component that um, we are struggling with is um, our special education, our special services department to be able to do the many evaluations, initial and reevaluations and assessments of students who have been referred or who are in need of specialized and related services. All of this work needs to be done in person. Um, virtual testing impacts the validity of standardized assessments and the testing required um, needs to be done in close proximity. So um, with all of our instruction happening remotely, there is an opportunity to use the appropriately ventilated spaces to do that work over the course of the first weeks of school, September 8th through October 2nd. The bulk order of um, PPE, the um, extra gloves that would be needed for this staff, the specialty face shields that are needed to be able to work in close proximity for this staff, as well as the individual testing supplies required to facilitate this work, and any of the devices that the paraprofessionals need to support this work have been back ordered. And while they're expected to arrive by the beginning of September, if you're like me, um, you're getting emails from all of your vendors saying anything that's coming from the Far East is further delayed. Um, so um, the district's going to continue to monitor the local conditions with regard to um, ventilation and air quality. Um, sorry about that. I just got a text that pulled me away. And working with the uh, Nutley Township Department of Health and the district physicians to monitor those local health conditions, to monitor the positivity rates for Nutley. And that's what's gonna determine when it's safe to advance to the next phase of reopening the schools. Again, it's our intention to begin to return students in October. Um, the plan would still be to return our youngest and most fragile learners to in-person instruction um, by October 15th. That way we would be able to ensure the delivery of general and special education and related services to those students with disabilities. Um, I think that uh, most of you are aware, you've heard us talk previously, you've probably seen um, the research and you also have seen a number of our district surveys, 
that indicate the students that are in preschool, kindergarten, our English language learning students, our self-contained special education students, and those with um, individual therapies and significant needs, and even those with behavioral and social issues, um, don't necessarily respond to a 100% virtual model. It might not be the most effective delivery of instruction for those students. So the need to introduce them to their new spaces, right? Many of those children, pre-K, kindergarten, English language learners, have never been inside the school buildings or classrooms before. So the need to introduce those new spaces, to create routines, to establish expectations for learning is gonna be critical for the success of all of these children and to be able to meet their needs. A phased reopening allows us to transition those populations to in-person instruction and some of the therapies in a controlled small environment and allow the necessary time and focus to let these students understand what it means to be in school, to be comfortable in school, and to help them to be the most successful that they can be in their program. The return to school would be within the option two hybrid model that we've already detailed um, for in-person instruction in the recovery plan. And I want to say, you know, we spent a lot of time talking last week about um, our intention as a school district to continue to do fire drills to make sure our students understood what to, to do in case of an emergency, even though the state did not prioritize that. Since last week, the state has backtracked. Um, the state will continue to require um, drills because there is still always the possibility of a real live emergency. This also allows us to prepare these students, again, our youngest and most fragile learners, um, without other people, without any um, hopeful, hopefully large crowds or confusion, to be able to practice those drills and understand what's necessary for them um, to be in person. So again, we would bring those populations back first at the beginning of October. The rest of the plan, um, the students in grades seven to 12 and the students in grades K to, uh, first grade to sixth grade, again, we have time to discuss their return, although we are still committed to their return. And I am gonna still talk about the rationale behind this return um, because I think it's important. Again, I talked about some of the ventilation questions. We're still having a number of questions about socialization, so I wanna make sure I address those with the return to school as well. Um, so the, the stated plan to the Department of Education has students in grades seven to 12 completing their first marking period virtually and returning in option two, the hybrid model of in-person instruction no later than November 9th. And the reason for November 9th, just so you know, um, the schools will be closed on election day. Um, we were anyway, but that is now um, a new executive order of the governor to allow voting to take place in the schools, even though I know all of my safety and security gurus on this call know how hard we work to try and get those polling places out. But the need um, to vote is, is critical. Um, at this time, we still have on the district calendar the NJEA convention. Um, that is in our collective bargaining unit in our calendar to allow our staff to participate in that. Um, that week of November 4th, also election week. So um, again, in our proposed plan, we return November 9th, depending on what happens with those convention days, depending on what happens with the COVID positivity rates. Um, and the local health conditions, we can certainly reevaluate those in-person return dates. And again, that was for seven to 12. Um, for grades one through six, we had, um, again, put into the plan to return after the first trimester. Easy to put into a plan, also easy to continue that discussion. So please remember that. Um, and they would also return in that hybrid model of instruction in this case, December 7th. And the rationale for that, just so you know, we already knew that we had that um, election week and convention week. Our elementary school conferences are scheduled um, right after that, the week of November 16th. And the thought was, the rationale was, 
that we would do those conferences in person, that teachers would meet with families and students, again, socially distanced with their masks, with all of the hygiene in place, but giving those students an opportunity to return to the school building um, in, in a smaller way, uh, be able to come into the classroom, to be able to speak to their teacher in person, um, ask any questions um, during that um, conference week, November 16th. And then again, like I said, after Thanksgiving and the end of the trimester, return them to the school buildings in an in-person way not set in stone. I think that might be the 10th time I've said it. So I hope all of the people that are listening tonight hear that again. I will answer it again if you ask, but um, I will say that again. Um, and again, between September 8th and December 7th, um, our phases of virtual instruction, um, we will as a district, I'm very proud to say that we will continue with our Department of Agriculture grant we will continue to feed all Nutley resident students under the age of 18 um, with breakfast and lunch with grab and go meals. Um, I'll promise to give you that information. Currently that curbside service continues. Um, it will continue through August 30th by the middle school doors. Um, again, I'm pretty proud that we've had a consistent 220 families that have been able to take advantage of that when we, um, reopen. I expect that we'll have maybe even more families and we'll give you details on where that um, pickup will be or where that distribution will be. Additionally, along with that uh, meal service, um, we will be able to provide that along with emergency child care um, to those families who have exhausted other child care options and who can document their employer's directive to return to work. And before you all start putting questions in the chat, what does that mean? There will be written guidance for you. Um, again, after everything is approved and the policies are approved, but I will say to you um, that we will hold that emergency child care, and it will be child care, at the Washington School. Washington School also has that geothermal um, temperature regulated environment with the HVAC. Um, we will be able to provide um, breakfast and lunch for the children in childcare in an outdoor tented environment. Um, we will also be able to provide um, some structured outdoor breaks, structured outdoor activities. But you should know, as it is childcare, it will be a safe place for students to be and to work while their parents are at work. It will be supervised. Their instruction will be virtual. It will be on their device in the assigned classroom in the child care space. It will not be taught in person by teachers. The teachers will not be available. They will be teaching um, your children even in child care, however virtually. Um, again, it will be centralized at one school, Washington School, um, because um, we will have the breakfast program. It will be able to start earlier. Um, Janine Locansolo will detail what the virtual schedule will be, and we'll make sure that our, um, our emergency child care will meet with that schedule so every parent will be able to, working parent, will be able to get their child to school in time for breakfast and in time to be in place at their seat with their device to start their virtual instruction with the rest of their class. And we'll also talk about that in a minute. That's probably 20 other questions that I had from last week. So I promise to detail that in a minute. Um, another piece of our reopening plan um, is our social emotional learning. And even though I've asked you um, to close your eyes, to visualize what this school year will look like, it will not look like any other school year. It will not look like school that you know or even recognize. Each classroom will have desks all facing forward, one direction facing the teacher or supervisor. Those desks will be socially distanced at six feet apart. Everybody will be wearing a mask. That's it. There, there's no manipulatives in the classroom. There's no centers, no rugs, no pillows, no reading space. We will be at those seats. It will not be... Um, an opportunity to socialize. There will not be recess. 
There will not be lunch served. As the students leave, they'll be able to get their grab and go meals to take with them. Um, if they're not part of the, um, the child care and the hybrid model and our 100% virtual model, like I said, um, we'll have a distribution location for all those students. But we are still committed to the social and emotional learning. Um, as you probably heard the governor say on Friday and he passed new legislation on Saturday that the NJSIAA who um, governs sports in the state of New Jersey um, has continued with their guidelines. The Nutley Public Schools committed to following those guidelines whether we are virtual or in person. And we did communicate that last week. However, there are about 30 questions asking me, so I'm answering you again. We are committed to um, following the NJSIA guidelines. Sports actually started on Monday. Um, I know that there were cheerleading tryouts. I know we have had football practice, soccer, cross country. Um, and all of those are being done following that guidance. There is, just to give you again a picture, maybe a different picture than what you might expect. Students are not able to walk to practice. They are not able to drive themselves to practice. They must get a ride. They roll down their window. Their temperature is taken at the window. If it is 100.4 or more, that window goes up and that car keeps driving. There is a daily screening tool where they are asked about um, symptoms, where they are asked about have they traveled to any of the 35 states today that are considered hotspots that require quarantining? Have they been exposed to anybody that's tested positive to the COVID-19 virus? And that happens on a daily basis. So you know if you're not involved in sports currently or if your child is not participating, this guidance had us starting today. It runs until August 28th in person. Um, the practices happen in pods, meaning there are five to 10 students together. They are not the whole team at any time. Um, after the 28th, there is a two-week hiatus where uh, all of that conditioning happens online um, and virtually. And if, knock on wood, the health conditions, I'm knocking on everything these days and poo poo pooing. Sorry, I got superstitious along the way the last couple months. Um, if the health guidelines allow, um, the full season begins September 14th. And believe it or not, it's already over for some sports by October 2nd. Um, there are no championships this year. Anybody can participate in the playoffs, any team. Um, so we are continuing with that. Additionally, we are looking at opportunities for our extracurriculars and clubs um, to be able to continue either in person or virtually. Um, Dr. Riley has been working diligently to see how we can bring marching bands back since we've started our sports um, and to be able to um, look at our other opportunities for in-person um, choirs, those kinds of things and any of our clubs that we can do outdoors and in person in a socially distanced masked way. We will continue to um, figure out ways, and I do mean figure out, because some of the clubs, if you're a middle schooler, I don't know how I'm doing Trout Club virtually, but we haven't given up yet. We're still trying, um, and we will. We are trying to figure out how we can do our various clubs um, virtually. Additionally, school counseling will continue. I know that a lot of you have participated in the Schoology groups, the individual groups. That'll be continuing. That will be built into the virtual schedule also. Um, I believe that uh, Mr. Bania and Mrs. Locansolo will um, detail those things for you um, when we go through the virtual schedule and where they fit. Um, I, again, I want to be clear, we're all committed to bringing our students back. That heat index did not allow for us to complete the checklist. And again, the Department of Ed checklist came out after our plan. Please remember that we started working on our reentry back in June. It wasn't until June 26th that the Department of Education provided us our guidance document that we've been using um, as well as the other almost 600 districts in the state have been using to develop the plan to, to return to the school buildings. Um, all of our task forces 
have been wonderful. There's probably nothing that you're hearing tonight that wasn't heard in a safety and security. Please mute your phone or your channel. Dr. Dr. Glazer, it might be me, Charlie, and I appreciate what we're doing. Are, we going to continue, are you going to continue this discussion or are we going to go into some questions that you have? No, no, I'm answering the questions. Remember, we, we received the questions prepared. Yes. So I'm okay. trying to answer as many as I can during right. this presentation, knowing that um, Kent and Janine are going to continue with the virtual learning. And I do think that'll answer a number of the, the prepared questions. I just wanted to make sure everybody had a chance tonight, that's all. Yes, and I know that we're gonna get there. So again, I don't think that there's anything new that anybody that's been in a health and wellness, safety and security or configuration and infrastructure task force hasn't heard already. Those task forces are going to continue to meet. Um, those task force, uh, Mr. Miller, Eddie Miller, you're presenting to all of us. Thank you. Um, those task force will continue to meet because we do need to continue to monitor this health and safety as we plan to reopen in person. And I thank all of you who have been committed to that process. There are about 50 people on each of those task force that have participated consistently. In addition, um, I want you to, to know that our real-time portal, this is another question, um, will stay open until Friday the 21st. People do have the opportunity for when we return in person to make their choice of returning hybrid or staying virtual. And the reason that we left it open, um, we had about 35% of people choose virtual. We had about 45% of people choose in person. 80% made um, solid choices. And then there were about, and I don't mean to laugh, it's the, the hardest decision. I'm not sure how I would do it for my child, we had about 25% who changed their mind four or five times, who even after they thought the portal closed on the 14th at midnight were still emailing us to ask us to please keep it open so they could continue to change their mind through the weekend or emailed a variety of us, myself, Kent, Janine, other coordinators, trusted principals, um, special ed people to help them to help make the decision for them, that they were so conflicted for the health and safety of their children that they couldn't make a decision. So we were really, we were really um, almost split after 80% of our school families and 3,200 unique responses were logged in. Um, we will continue to try and help you um, understand and answer every question that you have so that you can make an informed decision for your child for when we do return in person. And I, I wanna keep saying that it is still your choice and option when we are able to return. Um, I also want to say um, that we spent a, a tremendous amount of time um, working on the virtual learning plan. Um, our draft plan is not the emergency or crisis plan that we had when we went out in March. I think you all know when we went in March, we were very fortunate well before other districts, we had a learning management system, we had Schoology, we were able to, to use the word of the month jargon pivot to um, virtual learning very quickly. And over the course of the spring, March to June, we continued to involve, evolve our virtual learning program just about every two weeks to provide more structure, to continue to provide additional um, direct instruction and in-person opportunities through Google. As you all know, we did do a survey of that spring process. We got a tremendous amount of feedback. We did five in-person sessions with an additional 300 people, an additional 600 comments. And I will tell you that virtual learning as we go into this new school year bears absolutely no resemblance to virtual learning of last spring. The model that you're gonna hear from Mr. Benya and Ms. Locan Solo tonight, and what you did hear last Wednesday, but I think um, the focus was still really on the hybrid model, that was where most of the questions were, um, really has resulted 
in a compact curricula that will be comprehensive, that will be rigorous, that is adaptable to either our in-person or online instruction. Um, one of the things particularly that you'll hear for seven to 12 is that the schedule stays the same. What you'll hear from elementary is that your cohorts stay the same. I know that when we talked about the choice between 100% virtual and our hybrid instruction, we were concerned with our staffing. We were concerned with having the, the uh, number of teachers necessary to be able to teach in a 100% virtual environment and a hybrid environment. By having this additional time and um, hopefully having all parents make their choice in the portal, our principals are gonna be able to schedule at the elementary level for all of our children to be able to be in either an A or B or ABV cohort while well, they'll be able to stay with their teacher in their school with their class. And again, Mrs. Locansolo will detail that for you tonight. I know there were a number of questions about that. So I hope that um, that, that takes those questions off the table. Um, please know that in all of our elementary schools, we have a consistent curricula. Schoology is the platform that we will be using. Um, we will continue to use Google Meet and other conferencing as best practice strategies for the delivery of instruction. We're going to continue to provide equitable access to education for all students, whether they are virtual or learning in a classroom. We, we have truly prepared for this. Please know that the district recognizes that the spring closures did result in learning loss for some of our students. And this year in our virtual instruction, we'll be able to emphasize um, our standards, right? We'll be able to look at skills, especially those in math and literacy, especially those that we know are essential for students to master. In addition to that academic component, again, um, we maintain our strategic plan goal, our board of education goal, our district goal for um, keeping the social and emotional education and wellness of our students as a primary area. Um, you're going to hear how we intend to do that, how we are um, hoping to work on the re-entry of our students to, to their buildings. And an example of that, again, a number of questions and comments, but an example of that would be how do the seventh graders acclimate to the middle school? Or how do the eighth, the last year's eighth graders acclimate to ninth grade at the high school? Before we return to in-person instruction, we will, we will be um, finding ways to bring those students in in a socially distanced appropriate manner so that all students can feel comfortable in that learning environment and have that opportunity even in a socially distanced, mask wearing way um, to, to have that opportunity to meet their teachers. We will be doing that um, virtually um, for those grade levels, certainly um, before school starts um, and perhaps at other grade levels as well. Please know, and I, and I will circle back to all of the other questions that I see in this chat so you know, um, I, I received a text that in the live stream we have almost 400 people also watching and adding comments to the chat. I will do my best to, to not repeat. Please know that if you have sent, if you have sent a letter, an email, the, please, mute, please mute, please mute. If you have sent an email to that um, question and comments for this board meeting, we will be also answering you. Don't think that you didn't get an email back and we didn't get your question. We've received them. We've created a spreadsheet of them. We're continuing to add to that spreadsheet and we'll work our way through this evening. Um, before I turn it over to Mr. Benya to, to start on the virtual learning model, I really do want to remind you that there's still work to be done over the next weeks. There are more meetings to be held. This is still, even though we know we've requested to, um, to start the school year 100% virtually, there is still work to be done. And I remain grateful for the 140 of you that are on this call, the 400 of you that are live streaming. I could not be more grateful for a community 
that cares for each of our students, all 4,200 of them, and each of our staff members, all 625 of them, as much as we all do. And I thank you. Um, Dr. Glazer, so um, we expect Kent Banya and uh, Janine Locansol and Alfie come in and go over what they did last week, the same, pretty much the same no, format. they're going to focus specifically on the virtual learning components at each grade level. Um, and they're going to talk about what those days look like specifically, time by time. So, Mr. Banya, I don't know if you want to share your screen and I'll mute. Um, and start, I guess, looking at some of these new questions um, um, to be ready to, to share. Mr. Bania, your screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, we have it, Mr. Bania. Okay, we will go through um, our option one, and we will highlight the areas through virtual learning. Um, this will be focused, and it, it, it will, is a part of our plan from the beginning. Uh, so it should sound familiar to many, but as we were discussing our all virtual option or option one, there were several priorities that we wanted to put in place. Um, and these priorities are, arise from us learning about remote learning, us receiving feedback from students, parents, and teachers, and us really thinking about our spring and how we could apply it to moving forward in the fall if we need to. We need to. Um, our priorities include a consistent schedule a schedule that can be predicted on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, so parents, teachers, and students know when the meets are happening, know what to expect um, in daily instruction. Um, we wanted to increase the structure and balance synchronous as well as asynchronous instruction. Uh, so synchronous would be where people, uh, where teachers and students meet for instruction the same time, um, they're all together. Asynchronous would be much more flexible, meeting at different times in different places. Uh, we want to include daily live instruction. So this would be every day, daily live instruction from our teachers to our students um, and assign students to teachers in their building. Uh, this is on more of the elementary side. We want to make sure our students uh, to the best of our ability are in the schools where they would uh, typically start. Um, we want to provide schedules that provided a high degree of transition to hybrid. We are planning on bringing students in at some point. And if we had schedules that could go back and forth, it would, uh, continue, uh, keep our continuity of learning uh, intact. Um, and we wanted to embed time in our schedules for remedial small group instruction, one-on-one -on -one instruction, and for teachers, parents, and students uh, to meet to talk about expectations and learning. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Janine to speak specifically to the elementary side of this structure. Janine? Thank you, Ken. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight as we share with the community the district's 100% virtual elementary instruction schedule that our team has been working on. So tonight we're providing more details on the 100% virtual schedule as it now will apply to all students for the first trimester. Just to give you um, a little bit of background, what you're looking at right now is the 100% virtual schedule for K through 3. The next slide will show you 4 through 6. But a lot, most of the information besides just some time changes that I'm about to share applies to grades K through six. So instead of repeating myself, I'm gonna speak right now to the K through six and just know that some of these times um, I'll go over separately when I move to the next slide. So again, as Mr. Banya mentioned, our 100% virtual instruction will be a mix of synchronous and asynchronous instruction. I did see already some questions in the chat about will students be meeting live with their teacher every day? And the answer to that is yes. And I'll walk you through what the daily schedule looks like in a few minutes. Um, but just to give you some background, the elementary classes are going to be split into two cohorts or groups essentially, A and B. Um, which will help us to organize the day and the scheduling by splitting the, class, the classes more or less in half to allow for more productive Google Meets with smaller groups of students and more focused instruction. So parents, when you receive notification on your child's teacher like you usually do before the start of school, you're also going to be receiving information on whether or not they are in cohort A or cohort B. So you'll have a teacher and then you'll have a cohort within that class as the first day approaches. 
So again, the elementary day will include a combination of live instruction for each cohort, as well as time for the teacher to meet with students um, for small group work and one-on-one. -on -one. I just wanna walk you through a typical day for the 100% um, virtual day for an elementary student. So again, right now you're looking at a schedule for grades K through three, and you'll see if we look at Monday, uh, Monday and Tuesday is um, the same schedule and Thursday and Friday is the same schedule. So I'll walk you through what that looks like. So for the 100% virtual schedule for the elementary students, the day will start with a morning meeting. That's gonna be a time for the teacher to bring all of her, his or her students together to welcome them to the day, maybe give some brief announcements, um, and also go over the expectations and the assignments for the day and the schedule. So we heard a lot of feedback from parents and teachers that this morning meeting um, was happening with many of our teachers in the spring and it really did set the tone for the kids to begin working um, and it kind of gave them the direction of what the expectations were for the day. Again, that morning meeting is brief. Um, it will happen between 8.40 and 9 o'clock and it may only just be a few minutes long just to get everyone together take attendance and set the goals for the day. From there, from 9 to 10, Group A will have some live direct instruction through Google Meet with the teacher. So just so we're all thinking about the same thing, right now we're on a Google Meet Live, so you're hearing me in real time, I'm answering your questions, and we're interacting directly. So this would be similar to what that live time would look like. From 10 till 11, you'll see there's work for um, students to work on assignments that are posted in Schoology. Um, during this time, they may also be um, watching pre-recorded videos that the teacher has made, or the teacher may invite specific students or individual students to small group instruction. So you'll notice that in that black font, that's time that's a little bit more flexible, where teachers will be prepping materials and meeting with students, and students may be doing some independent work in Schoology. From 11 to 12, the teacher would then be meeting with group or cohort B for the live direct instruction. And again, that live direct instruction is gonna focus mostly on um, English language arts and math with science and social studies as well. So for example, if you're starting a new science unit um, or a new social studies unit, some of that direct instruction time may be used for that content and then some of the other instruction may be in that follow-up independent work time through Schoology. And then the day ends from 12 to 3, again, with some flexible time where kids will be working on assignments. They may be pulled in small groups or individually. Um, they'll probably be watching some pre-recorded content as well. Specials like our art and our music, phys ed, world language, and media are also going to be embedded into this schedule. So every day for a half hour, um, students will have a special. And that special will be alternated between a live session and a pre-recorded session week by week. So one week, um, let's say in week one, my art lesson is pre-recorded. The next time art meets, it will be a live meet. The next time it will be pre-recorded. The next time it will be live. So that students will also be getting live instruction from their um, specials teachers as well. You'll notice on the bottom I have a note that says students will be scheduled to meet with their teacher for small group instruction at least twice weekly beyond the Google Meets above. So what you're seeing in blue font um, in this chart are when your child will be interacting live with their teacher. And this is only the starting point for what that interaction looks like. So in other words, at least for two different times during that week, potentially more, um, your child will be invited to small groups based on how the teacher is able to schedule those. I also do just wanna to speak to that Wednesday day for a minute. Um, you'll notice the schedule is a little bit more open-ended on Wednesdays, and we've talked about this even when we talked through the hybrid schedule, that this would be a time when the teacher could have a whole class meet. So most of the Google Meets throughout the week, besides those really brief morning meetings, are going to be either cohort meets or small group meets. So Wednesday would be a time for um, the teachers maybe to do a little social emotional lesson with the whole class, uh, maybe some team building and that sort of thing. Wednesday is also going to be a day when work will be assigned, possibly pre-recorded, possibly an additional um, live Google Meet as the teacher sees 
um, appropriate for where she is in the curriculum, he or she. Um, and also they'll be dropping office hours with our counselors on Wednesdays. So our school counselors will be offering some optional drop in hours just to make sure that we um, provide support for students if they need it. And I will just also say that at any point, students can reach out to school counselors or parents can reach out to them um, if they have concerns or they need advice or they just need someone to listen to it. It's not um, by any means limited to a day of the week in any way. Um, okay, next slide, please. So here you'll see grades four through six. And like I previously mentioned, the schedule is nearly identical, except that you'll notice those blue um, live Google Meets have been staggered. So instead of from nine to 10, there's no Google Meet for grades four through six. From 10 to 11, there is. Um, the reason that we developed the schedule this way is to allow for siblings who may be sharing devices um, to not necessarily have to be in synchronous live meets at the same time. That's not to say it will never happen because the small group instruction um, will be scheduled at different times, but we wanted to limit that as much as possible. And we got feedback from parents that that was something that they really valued as far as um, planning for their own day to have the Google Meet staggered. So if they wanted to you know, follow up with their child or listen in themselves, We've talked about this in the past, but a lot of times um, the live sessions and the pre-recorded sessions are really helping parents who partner with us as well because they're learning new ways to present content um, that may be different than the way that they learned it. So for them to support their children, we wanted to make sure that the Google Meets um, didn't overlap. Next slide, please. So again, just some additional information. Um, the students, again, will be scheduled to meet with their teacher for small group instruction. And that's going to happen at least twice weekly beyond the Google Meets that are outlined in the previous slides. And again, just to repeat, those specials, art, music, phys ed, world language, and media will be taught virtually through a combination of the live and pre-recorded lessons. And you can expect that they would have one special a day for 30 minutes um, in their schedule. And we're hoping to schedule that so that it's consistent, so that um, you'll know that every day from 9 to 9.30, your child has their special time. Next slide. We also wanted to highlight some elementary um, home school connections. This was a common theme that came up multiple times in parent surveys, from our teacher feedback as well, in our task forces. and. Um, to parents who have reached out to me individually. And we're um, taking a bunch of steps to make sure that the home school connections are really um, valued and um, that we support parents as much as we can at home because again, we know that you are partnering with us specifically on the elementary level with younger children. Uh, we're going to be asking teachers to um, pass or, or submit to um, Schoology weekly home learning plans. So these will be, sort of what I shared with you in the previous slide, but in more detail, a little bit of a map of what the week looks like, when those small group meetings will be happening, um, when the specials will be, and also a summary of different assignments that may be due. So just kind of the week at a glance. Um, and we, we got a lot of feedback that that would be really helpful. A lot of our teachers do this already, and we'll have some flexibility around the exact format that it takes but we wanted to make sure that that communication is going on. Um, second, we're going to be making at-home learning kits. We're actually in the process now. We placed orders for materials and um, waiting for them to arrive and getting those baggies together. But we're going to have um, two-gallon Ziploc baggies um, that we're going to stuff for each grade level with uh, some at-home learning materials, some math manipulatives, um, many of them uh, will be on cardstock that the kids will cut out. Some of them will be manipulatives that will actually, you know, buy for the kids specifically. But I know, for example, we'll do pattern blocks and we'll give you a sheet of them and the kids um, can then cut them out and use them. For our multi-sensory phonics program foundations, um, our K-1-2 students will get the letter tiles. Uh, that, that correspond with the foundations program so that they can manipulate them and move them around and make words during their virtual learning lessons. And our hope is that those virtual learning kits and also um, consumable workbooks and textbooks 
will be available for pickup at the schools. Um, we're working with the principals, and I know that they had um, some really good procedures in place at the end of the year for parents to drop off the materials that needed to come back. And we'll do something similar where we'll have um, different classes and grade levels with assigned times to come back to the school and pick up any consumable workbooks that the kids would need and those at-home learning kits. We're also working on um, using Google Meet for some parent meet and greets, um, similar to back to school nights, but possibly earlier in the year because we know now that um, we're in your homes with you teaching, you may need that information sooner than later. Um, so we're, we're working on ways that those Google Meets could also incorporate um, parents for one session and, and parents would be able to ask questions and hear more just from the teacher directly speaking to the parents about the curriculum and about um, how they'll be organizing things in Schoology and specifics about their schedule and teaching style. We're also going to be providing Schoology professional development for parents. I know Dr. Shoja, um, our technology coordinator, is working on that and we'll be providing that as well. Mr. Banya, I think that's my last slide. Okay, and, and thank you, Janine and Kent. And I, I, I must say, as a grandparent um, and, and a board member, but obviously a very involved person like the rest of my board, it, I think we answered quite a few of the questions that came up after our last presentation. And I think it's important to note that this is a, um, a chart that's in flow. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're going to be working with it pretty much every day. If something works better one particular time, I'm sure we're going to look at adjusting it. I, I appreciate the hard work you put into it, um, Kent and Janine, all of all the all the staff. Um, Dr. Glazer, you wanted to come back on board. I I believe Kent is presenting next. Yes, Ms. Kuzinska, I just wanted to share the the plan. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Kent. You know, and I'll do that in a in a expedited manner, but these plans are very similar to things we've been talking about all along for, for hybrid education at the middle school and high school. I just wanted to highlight this in, in very similar uh, graphics that we've been using uh, for the community, but at our middle school, um, all students will attend class every day, meeting uh, in a Google Meet virtually, uh, very similar to as they would in our in-person programming. Um, so all students, uh, one through four for the first three days and periods five through eight, for the second three days. We'd stay in the three-day cycle, so when we transition back to in-person, um, the education would be consistent. We would keep moving. Um, they would meet for 45 minutes in their class period virtually. Attendance will be taken there, um, and teachers will have discretion um, to uh, teach uh, directly, um, provide extensions, release students to small groups, bring them back to small groups. Um, so we would have a structured time for 45 minutes for those classes to meet. The, Expectation would be um, that teachers provide at least one hour of education per class, um, whether that be in person directly for 45 minutes or the activity plan for the afternoon uh, that they release students to. Uh, at our middle school, we would break for lunch and then we would have structured virtual office hours where teachers could ask students to arrive um, during a half an hour of pre-slotted time um, that you see there, uh, or students can arrive on their own if they're looking for extra help or help with an assignment uh, to move forward. So just to highlight the uh, Walker Middle School, we would be consistent with our hybrid planning. Uh, we would uh, have all students will meet in the morning period using Google Meet. Um, attendance will be taken there. Uh, teachers will move forward in the curriculum utilizing direct instruction practices. They will have the flexibility to release students to independent assignments or keep students, recall them later in the class time for small group work. Uh, assignments will be given for the afternoon. Um, between synchronous and asynchronous, each period teachers should, will plan for one uh, hour of instruction. Uh, a calendar of days will be preset. We will put out a calendar uh, for the fall and winter of our uh, G and H day schedules. Um, office hours will be used by teachers to pull students uh, that need more support or for students seeking additional support. And zero period will be offered uh, each day, but at a later time of 12 to 12.45. At our high school, you see a very similar schedule. And I, I don't have to go through it in, in uh, the detail there because it, it is very similar. Uh, we will, again, rotate uh, four periods in three-day cycles uh, in a similar fashion. The times are a little different. We had staggered the times uh, with returning in person. We wanted to stagger the entrance and exit of the different buildings at Franklin Avenue. Uh, so that will stay. Um, we will have, again, uh, students meeting for structured instruction during a class period in the morning. 
Um, the difference here is your period will occur, but before school starts, 755 to 840, only on G days. And again, they're, they're named G123, H123 with purpose, because that is the next um, type of schedule we have at our high school um, with all our different rotating drop schedule, schedules. So G is the next letter, and that's what we're utilizing here. Uh, teachers will be there for virtual office hours in the afternoon to support students in a similar fashion. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and um, Janine Lokensolik. Thank you again for the job you've done. Dr. Glazer, you wanted to come back in? Yes, we just have a couple of clarifying comments um, from the live stream and this that I want to make sure people are hearing correctly. It's hard to know when you're typing or when you've joined us to make sure you understand what we're talking about. Our issues with ventilation are the high heat index. We, we are not talking about filters or any of those things. All of those things were already addressed with our hybrid plan. Um, we, we had already brought in vendors with UV lights and that. This issue is specific to the high heat. And depending on when we have cooler days, when the positivity rates are low, when the Department of Health tells us that it is safe to return, then we can be looking at those eventualities. Additionally, um, just to be clear, Wednesday is not an open day. I don't know if Kent or Janine um, want to maybe re-detail what's happening on Wednesdays. We do have five days a week of instruction. Um, and I do want to make it clear, specials are not extra. You know, I hate calling them special classes. I know that's what people are used to. But in all honesty, each of those areas are curricular areas with their own standards and skills and content requirements. So yeah. no, they can be canceled. Um, I don't know, Kent or Janine, if you want to talk about Wednesday again and maybe some more depth. Sure, yeah. Um, Mr. Banya, are you still presenting? He just came out because I okay. can see myself suddenly. Okay. Um, if you go back, and we don't need to go back to the graphic, but if we do go back to the graphic schedule, I just want to point out that that Wednesday um, is for small group instruction, additional um, instructional. So it's small group instruction um, and the whole class meet, the counselor drop in. But that small group instruction can also include things like our strategies program for students who may need support um, in basic skills. Um, our gifted and talented program will also be seeing small groups. So what we've tried to do is give some flexibility around there to when small groups could meet. So this allows small groups to meet throughout the day. For example, if a teacher wants to do guided reading or if a teacher wants to, a lot of our um, teachers are going to be doing assessments. Um, they're going to be doing virtual running record reading assessments, for example, and it gives them a big chunk of time to also be able to schedule kids one after the other individually. But yeah, I, I apologize if there was any misunderstanding there. There's still instruction going on on Wednesdays. It's by no means a free day. Dr. Glazer. The, the other comments were about technology. I do want to let the community know that, again, another area that we're proud of, um, I'm really proud of the food service, but I was also very proud that every family had a device and internet in the spring. And we were able to learn that, you know, for some families that sharing of devices or siblings or parents sharing with kids when they were working was very challenging. Um, we have been able to, and I'm again, couldn't be prouder of this, Mr. DePisa, our new business administrator, Josh Shoza, our director, our coordinator of integrated instructional technology, Mr. Banya, Mr. Vmeister, have worked tirelessly to be able to bring our one-to-one -one initiative down to the lower grades. We just found out today that we also um, received the digital divide monies from the state that we were approved from that. I don't know, Mr. Banya, if you want to talk about how many additional devices that means. Um, definitely not for the first day of school, ladies and gentlemen. They are back ordered, as I said, um, but soon, and by soon, sooner than later, they're telling us. But Kent, do you want to talk? I, I can speak to that, Dr. Glazer. Uh, we've received uh, $200,000 in digital divide. We applied for the grant uh, about a week and a half ago, and tonight I was notified that we received that money. With that money, in addition to the 1,000 Chromebooks that we have purchased uh, for our, from our general budget, we're, we're able to purchase another uh, 675, I believe, for a total of 1675 devices um, that are currently 
on their way to the district um, the soonest we can get them. Mr. Bain, can you put the schedule back up again? Hold, hold, hold on, please. Thank. Hold, hold on. Time out. Somebody. Um, I, we'll, we'll get to everybody. Just, um, Dr. Glazer, did you have something else you wanted to talk about as far as technology is concerned? No, I'm going to, like I said, we can go back to the chats um, okay. where we have comments I wanna, I want to, on the live stream and on the, the this screen. I think I've got to read our statement first and then we can go Absolutely. into. Uh, then I'll go okay. right through it. All right. Mr. Mr. Uh, Viemeister, can you take that slide down, please? Okay. Uh, okay, you got that up, money. Okay, thank you. All right, and and I assure everybody where we're going to have time to uh, look at all the chats that I've seen, some of the concerns that I've had. There's there's a lot of talk going on online, um, and and before I do read my statement, I, I need to say as a board member, and and I've been one on and off for 24 years. When my daughters were in grammar school and, and on through to high school and now I'm working on my grandchildren. As, as board members, we hear your concerns. As board members, everything that's been talked about tonight, we know or we deal with or we've heard. And we don't always agree with what we hear just like you don't agree with what you hear. But we, we live it every day like you. I live it through my grandchildren. I, I talk to my 10 year old grand, grandson who's in grammar school in Nutley. I talked to my 13 year old grandson who's in the middle school in Nutley. Um, and there's other board members that might want to say something. We, we appreciate your input. We work very hard as volunteers doing the job we're trying to do for you because we represent you. We hear everybody. I, I've probably received more emails and texts only because of technology than I did when I was working with Dr. Fadul in 1996. But it, it in material, we, we are concerned about what's going on in Nutley. That's why we're here. That's why we volunteer our time. So we work hard with you to try to answer all your questions. We, we keep as much time as we can. We talk to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, Janine, to, to our business administrator on a daily basis, sometimes two or three or four or five times a day. Saturdays and Sundays don't make any difference to us as board members. As, as Dr. Glazer will tell you, I'm an early riser. So speaking to her at six o'clock in the morning is not a problem for me. Or talking to Dave DePisa the other morning on a Sunday morning at seven o'clock is what we do as board members because we're here to represent you. So we care about your input. We're here for that reason, and and we have we have parents, we have grandparents, we we have single mother parents, we we have the whole mix of board members here. And I know some of my board members, we they all we all received your emails, some more than others, and and some of our board members wanted to give a little bit of input before we start this conversation on how we do care and how we listen to what's going on. Um, Mrs. Zarrow, I know you might have had something you wanted to say. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so just to, to follow up with what he said, our job is to make sure that everybody returns to school safely, uh, meets the requirements. It's not always about what personally is easiest for everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sure everybody knows I'm a single working mother. My child is in some special needs classes. I understand everybody's concerns, but it's not about me and my individual needs. It's about safety. So just so everyone knows, <clears throat> excuse me, we're all doing everything we can. Nobody's looking at this on an individual matter. It's being looked at as a whole. And sometimes the whole works out for some people and doesn't work out for others, self-included. Still need to do what's best for everybody and what we have an obligation to do, and that's follow the safety standards. Thank you very much, Ms. Zarrow. And, and I know the, the turmoil you've gone through dealing with um, your health issues that you were dealing with and, and dealing with um, your, your son, just like my grandsons and, and uh, some other board members. Now would be the time before we get started into our discussion if other board members would like to have an input about what you do or what we do as a team in the Board of Education, not Lee, I, I would appreciate your input. If not, we'll move on to um, discussions from the public. Charlie, if we're good, I'd like to speak. Certainly. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. sir. So, so I just want to so I'm tracking everything, I've read every email that's come in. I've spoke to uh, Charlie, I've talked to Kenny, 
um, Ken, um, I should say, uh, Ken Riley and Mr. Kaczynski. Um, 139 districts applied for different reasons. I read the document that we submitted to, this, to the uh, state that Dr. Glazier went through. Everything she said is exactly correct. We need to think about the safety of students first. If you track the rest of the country, and I know we're in a better shape than they are, but every single school, colleges um, that just opened are already closing a week later. Um, I've been watching, and, and you all have to, I've been watching on all my friends on Facebook. Every Little League is supposed to be wearing masks on the benches. They're not. I watch kids out in the park running around with their parents. They're all on top of each other. They're not wearing a mask. They're not. If we open and aren't right in the schools first, they come back in the first time, and you heard Dr. Glazier, if we get one, it's the, one, it's this. If it's two, it's the school. If it's this, it's the district. So we want to make sure we're safe. We want to make sure we recover from the summer and everybody being away. We want to make sure that we're doing things properly. The ventilation sticks, and we want to be as safe as your kids. So, um, and the, I think the aftercare that Dr. Glazer, the the Washington School, is a great synopsis for working parents. There'll be a desk to be able to work there. I think we've looked at everything, and I think this board is thoroughly looked through every single case. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kaczynski. Thank you, Mr. Slara, and, and thank you for your time. I, I know you're leaving us, unfortunately, and I don't mean leaving us. I mean, you're you're, <laughs> you're moving on to bigger and better things, I hope, but I, I can't say enough about the job you've done for Nutley, certainly for Nutley Board of Education in your time as a, as a um, um, in your time in Trenton, which was very helpful to Nutley, and your time on Nutley Board of Education, you, you've been, I love you as a friend, but I certainly appreciate you as a board member also. Thank you. Um, any other board members like to say something now? Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Mr. No, Mr. President, if you have a, if we have a question, can we wait till later or do you want us to, to, discuss that now i mean i know you want to no i, I don't know how you no now i guess now's our time terry we'll tell you, because when we're getting to the public we're going to be rather busy but I'll, I'll take questions from the board members certainly okay so um in regards to like all the ieps right now um helen and her department will be Re, uh, reviewing all of them and rewriting them because they all basically right now say in class learning and we have to adjust that. So how are we addressing the replacement um, child, the child who goes to the resource room and learns? How are we addressing that? Like, are we providing uh, um, virtual learning just for them with that with that particular teacher? So that's a great question. Am I unmuted? I don't even know anymore. No, no, that's, no, no. that's a great question, Terry. So in the hybrid model, um, I don't know if you remember when we presented last week, we weren't able to um, section the um, replacement students, right, into a cohort. Mm -hmm. They had to cross over. I think that that has to be looked at in the virtual environment because you do have the opportunity to do what our original plan was and just continue that instruction as a replacement model. Helen um, Doyle Marino, April Vidiello, they are putting together a schedule to do those evaluations, reevaluations, therapeutic appointments in September. All of that will be done in person, as I said, um, and all of those individual um, educational plans, IEPs that Terry's talking about, will be modified if necessary um, and made to work. Please remember though, that our goal is to bring those students back first, right? Our goal is to be able to modify their IEP for the hybrid model, not for 100% virtual. And I do wanna just repeat who those constituencies are in case anybody joined late, because I'm still seeing questions um, about this in the live stream. The, it would be pre-K right, coming back in October. It would be kindergarten. It would be our self-contained special education students. It would be our English language learning students. They would be the ones coming back into the buildings first so we could transition them, acclimate them. We would be using the hybrid model. Um, in the hybrid model as presented, you know, we weren't able to, with social distancing and staffing, do some of those groups more than two days a week. And I know that was of concern to some of the special education parents. Helen and April will be looking at that. 
And in that short amount of time where you transition people, maybe something can be done differently. But when we fully return in that hybrid model until we can come back to school without that, that social distancing and lowered capacity, for some of those constituencies and populations, we do have to have um, the, the staffing necessary, right? Like what we talked about with the replacement. So in regards to speech and OT and PT, I'm sorry, in regards to speech, OT and PT, they'll be virtual until we're so able to come depending, back. Depending, again, depending on what the need is, right? For some of our students, they were very successful using the telemed um, process. But again, it depends on what their needs are. For, for when they're evaluated, right? When we look at those therapies, there is an opportunity to bring in those high priority, the, the, the children that were not successful. And again, that's, uh, that's why they call it an individual education plan. I can't, I can't lump 14% um, of our student population into one answer, unfortunately, but you know that. And just one more thing, in regards to the teachers, they're supposed to come out um, and actually teach virtually. What happens, like, because being a teacher, I, I like to have all my equipment next to me. Like, I like to be around everything. So what happens if, say, you have a teacher who wants to go back into her classroom with a smart board or whatever she has, would she be allowed to have lessons there, or is that not going to be? Well, it depends on her classroom or his classroom. Okay. If it's one of the spaces that we've identified as an inappropriate space because of the high heat index or ventilation, they couldn't be in their own classroom. But if they, they needed to be in because there wasn't a um, professional space at home or there was some other, um, you know, contravening issue, um, we would try and provide an appropriate classroom space for them to be able to do that. Okay. But you could hear when you went through the list, like, you know that there were a number of those classrooms that were off limits. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Sure. Any other board members like to make uh, any questions or a statement now before we move on to the audience? Mr. Riley. Yeah, I have a question, Mr. Sure. Uh, President. Is, is Mr. Parigi on this call? I don't know. Michael, yeah. are you in? Yeah. Yes. There we go. Yep. Michael, how are you? Good, sir. I just have one quick question. Um, you know, one of the main issues with us not being able to return to school, at least on a hybrid, is because of the ventilation, correct? And some sort, yeah. So have you looked into bipolar ionization? Yes. And would that help us through Univents to, to I mean, it takes care of mold and SARS and all kinds of uh, issues. What's involved with that cost-wise, and, and and will that help us? Uh, yes, it would help. Classroom, I got a one quote from one vendor. That's quite a large vendor in New Jersey. I think I could be off. I'm sorry if I misquote it, but I think it's like $800 a classroom at this time. I mean, the, the popularity, yeah. I guess. And larger right. space that, for the gyms and auditoriums would be you know, a couple thousand to take care of a larger space. Right, and that's installed that, that, because it's a. Uh, it has to be wired. It has to be hooked up to the fan controls. Understood. But uh, I mean, we're looking for anything that can get us back into the classroom sooner rather than mm -hmm. later. Again, it would so if, be, if that would help. Yes, it, it's. The ventilation, we should look at. It's the the heat index that we're concerned about, not just the ventilation. You now we have. Proper ventilation in all the classrooms. You know, classrooms are designed for 15% fresh air at all times. But when you're wearing a mask in a classroom, you know, overheating is an issue. No, well, understood. But I mean, the, the world changes in September, right? I mean, we're not dealing yeah. with uh, July and August 95 degrees. Yep. Correct. All right. So I mean, no, I, I mean, if, we looked if into we it. Can get a handle on that as a full board. I'd appreciate it, cost-wise, number of classrooms, etc. Yes, they're supposed to come back in another week or two. They're supposed to call and schedule a time. I'm not going to say the vendor online, but it's a uh, local. Hopefully, hopefully it's sooner than that. But uh, I understand you're working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board members now? Yes, Mr. President. 
Yes, go ahead, Mr. Ferrara. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so the question I have is um, starting the school year virtual with the, um, with the intention of obviously transitioning in. So we have parents who, if, if I heard correctly, it was kind of uh, like almost a split, a split between 100% virtual and 50% and, 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 uh, virtual and 50% um, hybrid. Um, what happens you know, as we start transitioning to the parents who have chosen 100% hybrid? Uh, does that does that child still stay with that teacher, or is there a separate classroom that's going to be, that's going to start in September for the hundred percent high hundred uh, percent virtual students? So so we detailed that at the beginning, and we'll talk about it again as we're making the schedule. We're making a class, right? Where they're either going to be on the A day or the B day. And those students that have chosen hybrid and those students that have chosen virtual are still gonna be assigned to a teacher. Janine, do you wanna go through and detail that and maybe give some um, you know, models that, that could explain it or help people visualize it? Sure, yeah, so Thank within the, the elementary cohorts, every teacher is gonna have a cohort A and B. And it's possible that either of those A or B cohorts could be virtual. Um, so if you, for example, get um, a cohort that says cohort A in parentheses V, that means that you're in a cohort that will ultimately be virtual um, because that was your preference um, in real time. Um, so the short answer is that we worked around this. Um, we heard from parents that it was a really clear concern um, that they didn't want their students with a teacher that was district wide. That was one of our original. Excuse me, excuse me one second. Somebody needs to turn their mic off, please. Okay. Uh, and so, so we figured out a way to embed those virtual only students into the classes so that they won't have a teacher from across the district or from another building as their teacher is the shorter answer for that. That's, that's, that's good. Um, then, then, with that, then my, my next question is, um, what happens, and again, I, I'm gonna just hypothetic here, what happens to the staff that um, for medical reasons um, is 100% is virtual? So, so, um, Mr. Ferrer, for right now, they're already virtual, right? Um, when the policies are approved tonight, we'll be able to communicate with staff what's required for accommodations. We do have staff that have requested them. It requires an individual meeting. It requires some other follow-up um, that we have not been able to do. But by starting 100% virtually, we'll be able to address those individual accommodations. Okay, I understand that, so, but that will also address the, the, the students as well, right? Yes. For, for okay. most of the students, um, it's known through the um, school nurses, and I would say that the parents, again, I can't say enough wonderful things about our parents. Most of the parents who, who have students that meet those um, high-risk indicators have already reached out through their nurse, through their principal, through one of us, through the parent portal. Um, it's really the staff that we have not um, communicated with as far as accommodations other to say other than to say when the policies are approved um, we'll communicate what what's next as far as those individual meetings and determinations Thank okay, you. thanks and and well mr. president just one last question I'm sorry um, so uh, and dr. Glazer if I heard correctly uh, and I, I don't know if it was uh, Janine I don't know if it was Kent or you but um, there was some some discussion as far as the curriculum and the curriculum being modified in some ways to kind of um, Wait, you, bro you broke up Mr. Ferrer I can't hear you uh, the curriculum I, I, I thought I heard something as far as we're going to take the curriculum and we're going to you know take out the most important parts of it and kind of consolidate it for this virtual opening in September is that correct well, we're compacting the curriculum overall, right, for standards and skills. Kent, Janine, I think you both talked about that at the different levels. I, I don't know who wants to answer. Yeah, so, some of that work has been started already by our department coordinators, and, and we're starting to bring in some teachers um, in each department as well as in each grade level 
to start looking at scope and sequences and, and standards and starting to look at the most important uh, aspects of our curriculum that, that does need to be modified uh, for virtual instruction um, based on the parameters we have. So uh, we are compacting uh, curriculum, Mr. Farrar. We've started that process and it'll continue throughout the last two weeks of the summer as well as the first of September. Thank you. And, and, then that, that's, and then that will be shared, obviously, with all of the staff, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. That, that work is ongoing, and that'll be an important part of uh, before September, but also the first three days um, that we are allowed to bring teachers in for professional development. Thank you. And thank you, board members. I have a question, Dr. Glazer. Um, Frank DeMeo is not able to get in, um, and one of his questions was, is staff going to be allowed to teach from building if they want to? I think you answered that. You did answer that. Some teachers, and I've heard the same thing. Some teachers, especially special needs teachers, want to get back to their classroom. So oh, if, so if the answer, classroom, go ahead. I will answer it again. Because of our ventilation issues, our high heat issues, it might not be their classroom, but we will accommodate them in an appropriately um, ventilated health and safe space that they can do that if they want to come in. Again, it might not be their own classroom, depending on if it was one of those ones that was flagged um, for, for ventilation problem. Okay, um, I'll wait um, for Frank. Frank, uh, Frank, had, for another, Frank, uh, Frank had another question, Charlie, that he couldn't. I was just gonna get to that. Okay, um, good. Frank, good. I'm sorry, that's our, no problem. Um, obviously, we're a team. Um, Frank has another question through Erica to me. <laughs> um, he was not overjoyed about the Wednesday schedule. So um, I don't quite understand. Janine's explained it to him. I'll try to find out from Frank what his concern was. Um, but I, I don't want to hold up our audience all night long. So I'll speak to Frank. But I, I, if, if the board's okay, I'd like to move on to our open session and hearing from the parents. And, and I'll get more information from Frank. Is that okay? Could you, just repeat, could you just repeat what his question was he broke up? Well, he, he, um, he wasn't, I, I, don't, I won't read what he wrote, but he, he wasn't sure of the Wednesday schedule. Um, even though I think Janine's explained it and broken it down, he might not be comfortable with it, but I did not talk to him, but I, I will. I'd like to get some of our other parents on board if I could do okay. that first, if that's okay with everyone. What you, what you okay. asked, you broke up. Okay, board, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read our statement, then we'll start taking questions from the parents. And, and if other board members, including Frank, have some questions, I'll make sure we get them in. Where's the, uh, I'm sorry. Now we now come to the portion of our meeting where we allow members of the public to address the board. In this section, we allow questions or comments on resolutions only. Our board regulations number 169 will last 20 minutes for these communications. Each person should be limited to three minutes, and we ask you to try to stay within this requirement. And again, I encourage you to, if you haven't gotten the answer or if you think you're not going to get the answer tonight, we'll try to give it to you. But if not, reach out. We, we gave our emails out last week. Our numbers are listed. Unfortunately, I've been getting quite a few calls at my house, which is something I'm not used to. But aside from that, we're here to try to work with you. So I try to keep your comments to three minutes. I would appreciate that. Speakers may speak more than once only after all others wishing to speak on a topic have been heard. All statements will be directed to me as the chairperson. No one may address board members individually. Please be reminded that if your statement is too lengthy, abusive, obscene, irrelevant, or redundant, your participation may be terminated. Please remember to state your name and address each and every time you address the board. I will take Mr. Stoffers first since I, I, he looks like he's ready to talk. Michael. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Mike Stoffers. I'm the vice president of the Education Association of Nutley, uh, 337 Passaic Avenue. On behalf of the Education Association of Nutley, I want to thank Dr. Glazer and the board for taking the bold step to ensure the safety and well-being of the staff and students in the district by opening virtually for the first marking period and trimester. We know the decision was a difficult one and appreciate that the superintendent and board looked at the physical space, the data, and the science to come to their decision. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stoffers. Um, now I'll, I'll just briefly go back to Frank's statement, which is in the chat. Um, here is my question, and I, and I just, I just lost Frank's chat. I'm sorry. Um, Ian, can you find Frank DeMeo's chat or someone? Charlie, find I'm back. 
I just logged out, logged back in. My okay, question. Frank, was, okay, my thank question, God. Frank is back. And maybe I misunderstood, but when I was when I was watching before, it seems to me like the Wednesdays at the elementary school are it's not really a lot of instruction. Kind of just like a I, I don't know. Maybe I read it wrong, or maybe I listened wrong. But it doesn't seem like it's a rigorous um, instructive day. I should say instruct you know instruction day. Seems like it's kind of like a, a two hour breeze over and, and, and move on. I, I, I'm, why isn't it like the rest of the days is what I'm asking. Yeah, hi Frank, it's Janine. Um, I can just provide that it doesn't have as much structure as the other days right now in the plan as far as designated times for Google Meets, but that's for small group instruction. So some of the feedback that we heard from teachers is that it's helpful to have some time where they could schedule flexible small groups without being locked into a specific time like they are in the other days. So we can flesh that out a little bit more and be more specific about what's actually going to be happening there. But that would be a time for small groups like guided reading groups, um, math reinforcement groups, um, groups for our strategies, basic skills programs, and gifted and talented. So there would be small groups meeting throughout that week, but it wouldn't necessarily be a district-wide schedule of when those groups would meet. Okay, but my, my question still remains, if, if we were in school on a normal basis, which I know we're not, but if we yeah. were on a normal basis, there would be a normal scheduled day there. And we yeah. would still have time for all those other activities that you just explained. So my question remains, why are we not doing the same thing on Wednesday that we're doing the rest of the week? Mm -hmm. Just to chime in, I know it's an odd amount of days. It's five days a week. So I know you're trying like the two and two. And the Wednesday is probably like that day that it's like everybody kind of gets a little bit. But I know that since cohort A is Monday, Tuesday, B for the grammar school, at least is Thursday, Friday, maybe to Frank's point, if Wednesday can be like that day where you had the small group instruction, but could also dedicate some portion of the day to A and B that was a little more structured, it might ease everybody's concerns about the day and not make it seem so much like a free day i guess does that make sense not right? to believe it the, not, i don't yeah. want to i think we could definitely yeah, invent not not to like bring a little yeah. anything 100 percent, but right. just i don't want to i don't want to keep going because i want to hear from the public yeah. but my, just i just don't want to be in a position and i know last year we kind of got forced into this virtual thing and everybody knows how i really felt about it last year um but i don't want to be in the same situation we were in last year I do have a daughter in high school, so I did see a lot of the virtual. She had some very, very good teachers, and then there were some that didn't do as much as others. Um, but my, what, I'm, what I want to make sure is that everybody that's going to be logged in virtually as a student is getting the instruction they would be getting if they were in school. We're as close as possible as we can get to that. That's a point well taken, Frank. And I, I think you've made the point tonight where Kent and Janine and Dr. Glazer will revisit that Wednesday, virtual Wednesday or, or um, small session Wednesday and see if there's a better answer than what we have now. But appreciate that that input came back from parents and teachers about that particular Wednesday. But we certainly should revisit it, and I'm sure we will. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank you. Let's let's go to the first person that would like to talk. So, Charlie, I think we have to call on people. It'll be two. Okay. That's fine. We have hundreds of, of questions. I've been trying to answer them. Ken and Janine have been trying to answer them in the presentation, but I want to make sure um, okay. that this we're addressing everybody. Um, I think. Um, Sherry, we did answer that there's live instruction at the high school aside from office hours. Mr. Bania detailed that. Um, lots of lovely comments, by the way. I don't mean to skip all your lovely comments. We appreciate your support, number one. And Dr. Fadul, uh, may he rest in peace. Thank you for your comments. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that those get shared as well. Um, we, um, I think, did talk about the special needs students and live instruction. I believe that we talked about um, when special education children will be joining general education, especially in the integrated classrooms and in the um, resource time. Um, let's see. How will remote instruction be done? I think we've just spent the, the last hour or so detailing that, as well as 
on the special education piece. When students return to class, will attend, well, siblings attend the same days? Yes, that commitment hasn't changed. Um, that's, that's the same commitment. Um, the original hybrid model proposed last week will go into effect as written when we return um, to in-person instruction. And all virtual students receiving live instruction in the afternoon and at a lesser amount than the hybrid students. I'm not, I'm not getting that exactly. I'm thinking that must be when we return in the hybrid model. Um, Mrs. Ballou, if you want to unmute and give your address and ask the question yourself, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh, hi, Laser, can you hear me? Yes, I can hi, hear you. Yes, yes, we, yes we can. Regard to you need to tell us your address, Mrs. Proposed. Ballou. Sorry. Sorry. I went through. I, it, my question was to the plan that was proposed last week with um, the amount of time that the full will be given in, in live instruction versus the students who went back in the hybrid model. Is that the same model that will be used when we do go back hybrid? It's the same model, but fortunately, um, it gives us a little bit of time, just like Mr. DeMeo asked. It gives us a little bit of time to continue to refine yes. that. Okay, I understand. Just asking if that was the model that we were tied to or yeah. if this something that we can work the, with. The hybrid model is what, we're, what we'll go back to, yes. I, I, I just I, our, my concern is to my you know my son with an IEP and also my younger son with a 504 that these aren't things that we're going to be tied to as we're moving forward. I I, I think maybe I missed something. No, I, I'm not but, sure what you're being tied to. We're not, in all due respect, we're not we're not tied to anything. We, we've submitted a policy to the state of New Jersey that we're, is up for review, but the policy right. is, is a fluid policy. Um, our, our concerns for the IEP students, for the 504 students, is even more pressing than, than normal. So we are going to be looking at every aspect of bringing our children back whole. So, yes, the, right. the plan is still a week I, ago. I, I the so, so the choice that we make for will not be the choice we're held to moving forward. Oh, that's sorry. That's sorry. We, no, okay. I don't think any of us understood that that was what you were asking. The choice that you are making by Friday is so what we are using to make our right. what we're using to make our class groups and the same yes. policy that's in that plan for making a switch will be the same policy that's in place then. Okay, so that would be something we'd move forward with on an individual basis in regards yes. to IEPs and 504s. That answers yes. my question. I'm sorry if I made Thank that you. I'm no so problem. sorry I didn't Thank understand. You. No, 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 that's fine. Okay. Uh, next question. Thank you, Mrs. Blue. Next question is for Janine. Um, again, I think we've answered it, but um, I think that we're all benefiting from some repetition tonight. So. Will the teacher be doing live virtual lessons for the younger grades, not just a uh, recorded video? Yes, that live instruction is going to be happening daily. Um, it's built into the schedule for the cohort meets. It's the morning meeting is going to be live. And every week your child will have at least two designated periods of small group instruction, which also will be live. Thank you. And then, thanks. Um, let's see, what's the capacity of number of students that you'll accept and would you announce the dates, times, and procedures for child care? Is it only for parents with specific criterion? So it is emergency child care. It is um, for those members of our community that have exhausted their other child care options and have been required to return to work by their employer. Based on um, the real-time portal survey, I don't think that there will be um, a capacity issue. We believe that we can accommodate everybody that indicated that they needed 
um, child care. We do have policies that need to pass tonight. We do need to get that. We did keep the portal open until Friday for everyone. So we do need to get um, more um, designated dates, but we will be um, putting out all of the information about the emergency child care, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, as far as dates and times, um, it would start when school starts. And as I said at the beginning of the meeting, um, we believe that we'll be serving um, breakfast in the outdoor tented area for those children that want to take advantage of that, probably as early as eight o'clock, which is a big change from what we were thinking previously. I previously had said we would not be able to, to accept children that early. Um, in Janine's virtual timeline, it has the, the classes starting at 840. So we'd make sure that all the children have been fed, screened, and at their appropriate desk ready to um, engage in their virtual learning. And, and Dr. Glazer, I'm, I'm sure this is still being discussed by the board also. Yes, So it is. it's still a moving part. Yes, it is. We know we're going to do it. We know that it's going to be at Washington. We know that, that it will start with school starting. We know it starts with breakfast. And we'll give you the rest of the information as, as we can this week. And we already answered more face-to-face -face live. While we're in the virtual mode, can specials be canceled? I actually already answered this question as well. Specials are not extra. They're not electives. Specials are content area um, courses required by the Department of Education. They have their own standards. They have their own skills. Um, and honestly, that's some of the best places for your children to excel, right? When they're working with the PE teacher and they're doing um, some of those competitions and team building activities with their class or participating in art, um, we were very successful in continuing instrumental music and choir and all of those things virtually. We want to make sure that your students have that opportunity to, to have those um, special assignments as well. Thank you, um, everybody. We are still trying to, to keep that normalcy at every grade level. Not um, specials, yes. Will HVAC concerns be addressed before the return? Again, just to repeat what I've said several times and Michael Parigi has said, our issues in um, not opening um, immediately with the hybrid model is the high heat index. Um, it's the high no, heat index. Um, while Six, we are looking at all of the HVAC concerns. Excuse HVAC me, sir. Mr. Mr. Miller, Miller, could you please? Mr. Miller, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, we already have those parts back ordered. The, the repairs are in place. But um, the big issue, like I said, is the heat index and the number of classrooms that are unavailable to us due to high heat or windows that, that don't open fully for um, that fresh air. We choose 100% virtual now. Are we able to change to hybrid as we get closer? Again, following the, the policy that's detailed in the plan and that we spoke about next week, you would be able to change. Thank you. Um, air conditioning, what happens when the boilers get fired up? Um, again, the boilers, um, Mr. Parigi, don't turn on until we hit a different heat, a different cold index, I guess, not heat index. Do you want to address that, please? Can you unmute? Sorry. I think I caught you muted. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Mike, yeah, yes, Mike we have you. Go ahead. Thank sorry. you. Repeat the question. I'm sorry. Yes, it was, talk, Mark, you want to talk about the board? The, I'm sorry. It's our, Dr. Current, it's our current issue is the high heat index. And the question is what happens when the the boilers have to start. And I said, that's a different yeah, question than the high heat, it's the cold. <laughs> so <laughs> can you talk about when the, the boilers get um, started as far as the ventilation goes, please? Again, the ventilation in the schools were designed from original specs to have 15% fresh air at all times in the classrooms with the windows closed. Um, again, in the winter time, we'll have the windows open. Uh, if we won't have them fully open, we're gonna freeze to death. 
um, but the area will be ventilated and it is does supply fresh air to all the spaces. There is a couple units that we are working on, like Dr. Glazer said in prior that we have some parts on back order uh, and they will be in and functioning before that does happen. Thank you. And as far as the air cleaners and Merck filters, we've answered that a couple of times this evening as well. Um, if you still have that question, put it back in the um, portal and we'll have it answered individually. And um, I, encourage, I encourage people to, um, our wrong word, but pay attention a little bit because a lot of the questions that are coming up are redundant questions that we've we've talked over numerous times either last week or again this week. And not that we don't want to answer them, but they've been answered three or four or five times already. So I'd appreciate either call one of us individually or, or um, pay a little more attention to what our discussions have been going on. I would appreciate it. And, and actually, Janice Frazier, our next uh, person, has a suggestion. And yes, Janice, we are creating a frequently asked questions document. Um, we, we've started collecting those. We had a, um, a participant on last week's call who did an amazing job creating a Google Meet. Um, and that was the basis of the beginning, the basis of the beginning. I don't know if that's correct English, but that, that was, was the beginning of our <laughs> frequently asked questions document um, we're adding to that and we will also be putting out um, the frequently asked questions because many of them are the same as we go through we do just know how important it is for everybody to um, be making health and safety decisions for their children we're very sensitive to that we all have children and we want to make sure that we're, we're doing the best we can to answer that fifth grade Chromebooks I think Mr. Bain you already answered uh, that we did receive that grant we are gonna plan to go down to fifth grade with the Chromebooks it just won't start September 8th for everybody correct anything to, I see you nodding I just didn't know if you had anything we, to we currently um, are anticipating uh, to get um, or order 1675 Chromebooks and that brings us down several grade levels uh, the problem right now is that uh, like every every district they're on back order and we have orders in and we are waiting for them to come into district Thank you. Um, and yes, we are endeavoring to be able to tell you who your teachers are and your A and B cohorts um, and when they're assigned because we know that you have to make your own plans. Again, keeping the portal open till Friday, I know put that off um, for everybody. We don't typically tell um, which class your child's in till that Friday before school starts. So for our principals, they've all been working triple time um, to go through real time to make sure we can assign that to manually move siblings and um, whatever needs to happen to be able to communicate those assignments for you. Um, there will still be, um, as Janine um, talked about, the two cohorts in the virtual group, how they're being assigned um, with group A and group B. And, and again, everybody will stay in their school, they'll stay with their teacher um, as we are uh, moving forward. Um, the teachers are teaching. Um, the, the point of um, having some of the videos pre-recorded is if it's an instructional lesson, a student can go back and watch it again if they needed um, additional understanding or if they weren't able to come to the, to the live lesson. The live instruction is the primary component. Again, I think Kent and Janine have detailed that several times. We will be putting the um, grid plan out that you saw tonight. And if you still have a question about how that works, um, we'll make sure that we answer that again. Um, we're in a cohort and what do they do during the cohort B live lessons? Janine, can you just talk again one more time about what happens when cohort B is live, what does cohort A do? And vice versa, I guess. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that would be the time when um, the cohort that's not live is viewing those pre-recorded lessons. Um, they could possibly be doing assignments that are related to their last live les lesson. Maybe there's a math follow-up workbook page that went with the lesson that they did. That's also free time within their schedule so that if they have basic skills or if they get, let's say, gifted and talented, different differentiation could pull during that time too because it's not scheduled as a live meet. 
and we've talked about the instruction. We just answered what Group A will be doing. Um, again, can, can you just detail one more time what Group A will be doing at the high school when Group B is in? So, so at the high school, um, it's a little different strategy, right? All the students meet during their regularly scheduled period. When period one meets, they meet virtually for 45 minutes, so they will have class. There will be live instruction. Students will receive three hours of live instruction in the morning and then have time to go to office hours at the middle school that will be structured. So students at the middle school can receive an additional two hours if they choose to go to get extra help from their teachers that will be live. Thank you. Um, so everybody knows, um, Tracy has a, another question. Tracy Marinelli, she, she's been on once already. Um, she was talking about Google Meet and Zoom. At the beginning, Zoom was not a possibility. It wasn't a secure um, platform, which is why we went with Google Meet. Zoom is uh, more secure now. We certainly have um, our Schoology, and Schoology will be our main um, platform. I do think that um, we have to look at every eventuality as we go forward to make sure that what we're using with Schoology um, is the, the best choice for um, students. And yeah, this is a good question, Dr. Glazier, because for the young ones, as you even see tonight with the adults, it's so difficult because the host doesn't have the capability of muting everyone, which I know a lot of us- Excuse me. I, 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 you, you certainly can have your input. I need to know who you are. Well, I'm I need sorry, to know. Your... Charlie, I, had said, this was, I had already said that we had answered. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see your name. No problem. Thank you. Five white. I know who it was. <laughs> I know um, who it was. Just because it's difficult, and a lot of times the children are with grandparents, or um, unfortunately, I saw even some second graders that seem to be um, not being tended to for whatever reasons, and. Um, they didn't understand how to mute, so it, it was really uh, difficult for the, the teachers to manage. Mrs. Marinelli, I, I can comment that um, I, I think he, Ian is the, the person here that can mute people. So Google Meet does have a feature uh, like that. And I know Google Meet is expected to go through an update uh, next week. Um, while we agree with you, Zoom has, has certain features. Uh, we're hoping Google Meet has those breakout room features and other features uh, for the beginning of the school year. But, but I do agree with you, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you again. Positive comments here. Uh, when the hybrid model kicks in and kids choose 100% virtual, do they get a new teacher? We've answered that a couple times. No. Um, Janine has detailed the um, learning plan several times. Again, we'll publish that with the frequently asked questions to make sure that everybody understand what the, understands what that looks like. Um, all right, so Mrs. Um, Loke, Catherine Loke, um, if you could unmute and give us your address, um, I will um, read the question for Janine. In K-3, to assuming the student is incapable of navigating virtual instruction himself, someone needs to sit with the student from 8.40 to 3 o'clock every day to complete the schoolwork in full. Is that correct? Mrs. Loke, are you still with us? All right, Janine, if you could answer. Yes, yes she said yes in the chat. Oh, Sorry. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just so um, we're clear on the NJDOE guidance for grade K, the guidance is the students should have 2.5 hours of instructional work. And that includes both the time that they would be meeting with a teacher live and any work related to that instruction. And that number for um, the grades above K is four hours. Um, so what we're trying to do here is take into account one of those hours would be that live instruction. Um, and then you would have the small group time. You have to add in a half hour for specials. And then you have time when they would be working on assignments related to that direct instruction. And um, so that's where we're getting that number from. We did want to build in just to show you that you have some flexibility there within the school day to get that four hours of instruction. But um, our expectation isn't that students would be sitting in front of a screen um, for the entire day like that. Thank you. Um, okay. Just if you could give us your, your name and address out loud, please. Hi, um, this is Catherine. Um, 
Well, you see me have Catherine Lobb, so my last name is actually Anta. Okay. Um, <laughs> my uh, address is um, 38 Daily. Thank you so much. And I'm just trying to figure out what to do because I'm working full time. Like, I usually work about eight to 10 hours a day. My husband has 24 hour shifts. And I'm just trying to really get a good feel of what the day is going to be like so we can figure something out. And maybe the emergency child care will be a good suggestion for you when those details are released. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, we've spoken several times now. Wednesday is not an open day. I think in the last hour since these questions have been posted, um, Janine has detailed what Wednesday would look like. Every day there is four hours of instruction. Um, in the other chat, there's also a, a, a thread going about screen time and too much screen time. And I think Janine just answered that. Um, as well, that we it is four hours of instruction daily, and and the hope for outcome is that your children will have that opportunity to be up from the screen and doing other other um, learning and independent time. Um, let's see, middle school and high school, the full schedule when it's virtual. Um, can we talk, Kent? Can you just address why we can't run through the full schedule every day? and still have our staff um, doing doing all live instruction. Yeah, so uh, I just want to make sure my mic's on. Okay, so a lot of the feedback we received and uh, looking at what some other districts are doing, uh, districts that run through the full day seem to um, run through seven or eight periods in a 30 to 40 minute time span. Some of the feedback we received was that that was uh, too much for our students and our teachers to plan for and to do each day. And uh, with the remote environment, if we were able to take more of a semester approach um, where we do half the periods one day and half the periods the other day and expand the time in those periods, do a, a direct instruction and an assignment uh, to move the curriculum forward, as well as provide extra support and feedback, which is challenging when you run through all the periods in one day uh, for students uh, with the teacher schedule, um, that would be uh, more effective. And we received that feedback overwhelmingly from our task force groups as well as from some, from some of our survey data. So we're trying to do the, the semester approach within our school year. We're not set up for a periods one through four for the first two market periods and five through eight for the last two. So we're trying to accommodate that uh, for a couple of reasons we're not set up. Number one, it, it's, our curriculum's not written to, that, written to that. Number two, there are some courses that, that would pose a challenge to AP courses, things of that nature. So we're trying to accommodate uh, three you know, three days of four classes and followed up by three days of four classes, that semester approach within our weekly schedule in order to take the feedback we've received and do what's best for students and teachers. And we thought by doing this, we'd provide the best of both worlds and uh, be able to uh, meet the needs as well as take into account the social and emotional needs of students in a remote environment during this time. We've also spent a lot of time listening to the students and the staff. Um, who have responded and have been part of the task force. We have about 1,200 students at the high school. And um, each one of our students um, is able to take advantage of an eight period day. No, you know, without the study halls or zero periods, those kinds of things. And especially for our upperclassmen, they, they were very concerned about their transcripts. They were very concerned about um, making sure that um, whatever track that they were on for college or career um, that they would be able to continue that and in this model there is no break in their instruction whether we're virtual whether we're hybrid um, we, we can continue that instruction for them pretty seamlessly and then with the hope for outcome of returning right to, to a full in-person return then their schedule um, 7 through 12 is the least impacted. Dr. Glazer if I could add that that was also a concern is that when we return to hybrid uh, we were looking at running maybe our half day schedule or every period in our hybrid schedule. And that was very challenging. You're putting students in classes for maybe 30 minutes. Uh, 30 minutes is a tough instructional time. We'd like to increase that as well as have six or seven transitions between classrooms and kids in more spaces. So we decided to reduce that to four, increase the instructional time, reduce the transitions. And we're looking to mirror that in our virtual program as well. So we can transition into hybrid by the second marking period. Thanks. Thank Ken. you. 
And again, we have the um, the um, conversation about childcare. Those details will be very clear. You'll know which, which cohort your child is in. And again, the directions for um, accessing that childcare um, will have all of the procedures and protocols for you. Kent, the question is, G1, G2, G3, H1, H2, H3, what does that mean? I knew I was gonna get that question. Um, so at our high school, we have uh, a rotating drop schedule. It's A, B, C, and D days. We have an E day, which is an all meet day. We have an F day, which is a half day. So the next day, not to confuse anyone at our high school, is G. So we went with G1, G2, and G3, and then H1, H2, and H3. And originally at the middle school, we don't have that system, so we started with day one through six. As this evolved, and speaking to Mrs. Egan and as well as the high school team, we tried to make things con as consistent as possible so we're speaking the same language. So and recently, we tried to make them all G and H days consistent with the high school. Thank you, uh, Ken. I know we've gone through that three or four or five times, but it's simply a matter of semantics of just moving through the calendar. Um, ease of comfort for, your, for the staff and for the administrators at the high school and middle school. Yes, sir. And I do just want to say, we're still having comments about accessing devices. Um, we've said this over a period of the, the last week or so. Please send an email to virtuallearning at nutleyschools.org. That address is in the chat. Um, you may not hear in the same day or the same couple days or even the same week. Right now, you're just registering your request. Um, I have asked that, that the people that monitor that site at least let you know your request was received. Um, but we will do our best to, um, to respond individually. There, these are not um, staffed emails at this point. It's still in the summer. So please be mindful that we're accepting your, um, your request and we'll let you know that they're received, but you might not get an answer if you're getting a device today or an additional device um, at this time. Um, we've talked about childcare a few times. Um, we've talked about the live instruction and Wednesday. Um, we've talked about, Janine, do you want to just talk a little bit about, I don't think we have talked about how the cohorts are being determined, how the principal is doing that um, A, A, B, B, or B, V um, section. Sure, yeah, so um, the principals are looking at your real-time preferences for 100% virtual or hybrid, and then balancing out into cohorts so that each teacher has an A and a B cohort. And some of those cohorts are going to be designated for the virtual only students. So there will be some classes where you'll have a cohort A and the cohort B will actually have a little V in parentheses after it, which denotes that that's a virtual cohort um, when the time arises that we're going to be um, switching to hybrid. So every classroom will have two cohorts and some of those cohorts um, will be virtual only cohorts. So they're embedded into the regular classes. Originally, we had talked about kind of pooling them across the district, and we were really responsive to parents' concerns about that. Um, people feel really passionately about their homeschools, of course, and their friends and the relationships that they have. So we rethought the best way to um, schedule that, and now those students will be embedded into the homerooms within their school. Thank you. And thank you again. I have to reach out to the chat community. Thank you for answering questions to your, to your fellow chatters. Um, we are, it's wonderful that you're helping out. We appreciate that because it'll make tonight go a little bit quicker. So thanks everybody um, for, for chipping in. We appreciate it. Um, Janine did talk about when you were receiving books and other materials at home kits and packets. Um, I don't believe that that is the end of August, but Janine, can you just repeat the plan for the textbook pickup and the at-home kits, please? Yeah, um, we wanna do it as soon as possible, but we are still waiting for some of the materials that were ordered, things like the foundations workbooks and math workbooks. 
once they do arrive at the buildings need to be sorted and that sort of thing. But we're looking at the first week of September for that so that you'll have them for the first day. The at-home learning kits, um, some of the math manipulatives are back ordered. So there may have to be a second pickup the next week or the following week for that. But those aren't materials that you would need to begin the school year. Those would be um, a little bit down the line. And again, you know, unfortunately, every district's facing the same thing. The same way we're all working remotely, all of these companies are working remotely, all these warehouses are on staggered schedules, and we're, we're kind of at their mercy. Um, I, again, here, here is a suggestion, a good suggestion and question. I think it's been answered, but I, I want to make sure, because it's come up even in the live stream, if the Google Meets are scheduled in advance, right and the links are already there so the students can just click on what they need instead of copying and pasting and struggling to go back and forth within schoology yeah. that's a good suggestion thank you mm -hmm. um let's see and, and I just want to clarify, in case there was any misconception, Field Trip Fridays, Mindful Mondays, that was an opportunity to have four-day instructional weeks in the spring when people were, were really struggling to stay engaged. We're one of the few districts that kept actually instructing up until the last day of school. You don't see any Mindful Mondays or free Field Trip Fridays in any of the plans that were presented pre-K to 12. And I do want to reiterate again that the virtual learning that you are going to see starting in the fall here in September does not look like it looked in the spring. In the spring, we evolved every two weeks. In the spring, we were in an emergency mode to continue to provide structure, to continue to provide um, social emotional learning, and to be able to provide opportunities for students. Um, now that it it's not an emergency and it's well planned, um, you are not going to see any days off. And I think, again, we've, we've detailed that um, multiple times this evening. And I know people do appreciate the Mindful Mondays. I know there are a number of people that begged us to keep a four-day instructional week. But again, I'll repeat it for the sake of everybody's information. The Department of Education does require that we continue to have a 180-day school year there is no flexibility in that. Um, we do need to have um, the, at least four hours of instruction daily to, to meet that 180 day requirement. So we, as much as I know people appreciated that, um, that is not a possibility unless we're, we're, we're also planning for year round school in one of our task force. And I am not necessarily advocating that, just a joke, um, just a joke. No time, no time for jokes tonight. <laughs> well, I know, I know. I know. Although How I did doing? my time over joke was repeated. Um, so let's see, additional training. The teachers, we did talk about a lot of the professional development. Um, that professional development has already begun. Um, um, being taught by some of our own teachers who are, who are experts by our staff. I don't know if Ken or Janine you want to talk about some of the sessions that have already begun and what's what the some of the topics maybe i, I can speak to it uh, dr shoja has organized two weeks of uh technology training uh instructional technology training for some of our uh, teachers uh, we have started our new teacher orientation that involves some of that training uh, these are sessions uh that teacher it's optional for teachers i was in a session yesterday for screencastify had over 50 people in it one of our teachers was presenting uh, it was it was great. It was great. We're recording these, making them available for teachers that cannot attend. Uh, we're also uh, walking our new teachers through uh, what the year looks like and beginning to prep them for virtual learning. Um, outside of that, we are starting uh, some curricular work, as mentioned before, um, bringing teachers in to start looking at our different uh, various curricula in different areas and starting to make um, decisions that's coordinator supported on um, you know the curriculum, the compacting curriculum we've been talking about. That has started coupled with the three days of uh, mandatory PD at the beginning of the school year. Uh, we hope to have um, a good start to uh, being prepared for this year of virtual learning. Thanks, Kent. And, and I just wanna clarify, I see Erica answered. There was a survey given where we asked families 
um, if they would need child care. We had 3,800 of our 4,200 families respond to that. We used that as a basis that child care was a need. There is not an additional survey for the emergency child care. It will be an application. And again, we will um, get that out this week so people can work with their employers um, to get the um, information that will be required. Um, in child care, um, the instruction will be virtual instruction. The people that will be there will be there to supervise your children and make sure they're safe. They'll be able to help them get on to a Google Meet. They'll be able to help them, um, you know, turn on their Chromebook or if they're having a, a struggle, but they are not there to help with instruction. They're not providing any tutoring, just, just to make a safe environment. Um, let's see. The hope for outcome is that kindergarten will start in October. Um, we do not know when the, the grammar schools will start. Again, we were required as part of our plan to put in a timeline. Um, the timeline we used was based on the marking period and trimester. That is not set in stone. Um, again, if you've sent an email to request a device, um, you may have to wait a week or more. We'll let you know that um, it was received, but you might not have an answer immediately. As we've said, we've ordered um, a, a large number of devices. Many of them are back ordered, promised at different times of delivery. But we will let you know what we're able to do to help you. Um, this this has come up a lot in both groups. We've talked about it in in our administrators groups. We've talked about it actually with the board. Um, the possibility of outdoor socially distanced teacher meet and greet for elementary students in September. We don't believe that it's possible prior to the start of school. Um, we've looked at how we might be able to do that by grade or class or school, um, have the teachers do it. Um, we've looked at, you know, um, I know some of you suggested the model of the ice cream social, the pre-K ice cream social at Parks and Rec. All of these ideas are amazing ideas, just not ideas that can be implemented um, with everything else that has to be done to, to start 100% virtually. I do believe um, from the, the large number of emails that I've been getting that there are PTO groups that are um, diligently working to, to try and do these socially distanced um, meet and greets and include the teachers. Um, I, I've let the PTOs know that our teachers are amazing. They're above and beyond. I know that they in the spring they were at every parade and um, did all of those wonderful, cute videos. I, I don't know that I can. The question was, can I make it mandatory for the teachers to attend? I don't believe that I can. Um, and, and, you know, part of the issue then is equity, right? Um, I, I think that we have to continue to look at this and see how we are able to help students um, meet their teachers. Again, we have a plan for seventh graders, for incoming ninth graders before we return in person. I think that um, at the elementary level, using that conference time, um, there's an opportunity there, um, and we'll have to continue to continue to have this discussion to see how we can effectuate that for 4,200 students. Um, Nothing, Doc. Just check in, see how we're doing. <laughs> just, we're doing okay, actually, we're only about 15 minutes behind instead of two hours like last week. So uh, I know we're, do, we're doing much better. Yeah, having the questions coming in advance has been very, very helpful. That helped us, and, and um, having having people call us or email us or contact us in between last meeting, I think has been helpful because we've all been able to answer some of the questions. Um, we're just dealing with a little a little redundancy tonight, but but we'll get through that. And I think that Philly, you were on both meetings, but I'm not sure everybody that's on tonight was on last week. Um, Ian. Um, our IT manager did post the video. He said video and all related documents will be posted here. So you will be able to, to see the, the minutes, the video, any of the, the schedules and documents. Again, as far as the sixth graders receiving their Chromebooks, when we receive them, 
We will turn key those to the sixth graders. We have asked anybody that's borrowed a device um, to continue using that device. We allowed everybody to keep them through the summer. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to get a quick start um, again. There will not be a survey for child care. We will just be putting out the information yet this week and people will apply. Um, the Catherine, I see you. Christine Molinari, um, did you want to make a statement? Christina, if you do, um, please unmute and please give your address before you start to speak, please. Thank you. Um, Christina Molinari, 40 Jefferson Street. Um, I'm looking at this grammar school schedule here, and I don't think it's much different than the spring one. It looks like it's one hour of live instruction from the teachers, and the rest is mainly independently. So that gives a lot of responsibility, again, to the parents and caregivers of the students. And most of us, um, many of us are not teachers, not able to stay home with our children. So what do we do in this case? Um, we have to report to work and uh, our jobs will be at jeopardy if we don't show up for work. And also we would have to pay someone for childcare to stay home with our child during school days because most of the responsibility is uh, it's independent study. So what has really changed from the spring when we were staying home with our children from nine to three doing schoolwork or even later? So I am a little confused. There should be more virtual teaching from the teachers. This is what teachers do. This is their job. So I don't understand what's going on here. So let Janine perhaps can answer Mrs. Molinari. Thank you so much. You might need to mute so you can hear Janine. Yep, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, and we've tried to be as responsive as we can to these concerns. We're, we're really trying to balance out the schedule. I think what we found in the spring is that there was an uneven um, way that different teachers were scheduling that time. Some were doing more live meets, some were doing more pre-recorded. So we wanted to standardize um, some of the live instruction, but this is the starting point for teachers to build their schedule around. So we're saying that this is these are the required meets that are going to be happening on a consistent basis, but teachers will be adding those small group meets in addition to that. Um, and maybe we need to be more specific about that in the schedule um, where those small group meets are happening. Remember, you're also going to have your special um, built into that schedule, which will often be live as well. Um, but we absolutely understand that um, you know some parents would rather have more of that live instruction and we're just balancing that with thinking about what's developmentally appropriate for the grammar school kids as well for how long they can sit in front of a screen and be meaningfully engaged as well so we're trying to balance those two things what i will say is that we are offering that child care and that might be something that can help um support you as well um, I would definitely advise looking into that too if it's something that you think would help you because I completely understand as a working parent myself with two little kids in grammar school, um, it, it's a heavy lift for sure. Thank you, thank, thank you, you Jane. How many children in the emergency childcare in a room? It, that doesn't change from what we had in the hybrid model. I can't have any more. Than, than what the room held with six feet of social distancing um, in the capacity before. So some rooms, eight, 10, um, probably no room larger than 12. And what what would be the hours of that? I'm sorry? What would be the hours of the emergency child care? So as I've said several times, we know that we'll be serving breakfast probably at eight. The virtual instruction starts at 8.40. And that's as far as I can tell you. Mrs. I don't Molinari, know how it depends on staffing. Mrs. Molinari, as we mentioned before, that's that's still a work in progress. So, um, and and I don't mind having that discussion later or offline. But that plan has not completely been 
um, talked about, discussed completely, so we don't have the exact hours or the amount of people or the amount of space just yet. So we'll have to spend more time on that later on, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the high school will still be hosting SAT exams. As a county, we made a decision not to do that for the August exam. The September exam, the SATs, I think, are, are looking to try and do virtual. We've been talking about how we might be able to do a socially distanced hosting, if you will. I'm not, not sure. Um, we're still all talking about it, but I think that's the October. Kent, you can give me a thumbs up or a nod. It's the October test that we're aiming for is the first one if we're able to host it. Um, and again, there are several districts we're working on together. Um, the college board is, is um, trying to decide how they're gonna proceed as well. Um, am I to understand that my child's IEP will be amended and signed for virtual learning for day one? No, what we presented is that starting at the beginning that all the children, um, in October, we'll be having the um, the eval the initial evaluations, the reevals, the testing, the the therapy um, evals, all at the same time as the um, virtual learning. So we'll be creating those plans, and the hope for outcome um, is for the students to to have that individual work with the assessments to be able to receive their virtual learning and to return to the buildings to be the first groups to be returned to the buildings in October. Dr. Glazer? Yes. Uh, this is Jennifer Farrow, 19.4. Thank you. God, that, that was my question. And okay. um, I think that you had said earlier in the meeting that um, the, the IEPs would be amended. Now, my son is a high school senior. He has been evaluated and his IEP is in place. So for day one of virtual learning, he's going by the IEP that he's current, you know, he currently has. His, his IEP is in place for September. So what, what how, how, how do we take care of it for those students? So, so they'll be following their instructional model. Mrs. Um, Doyle Marino, Mrs. Uh, Vidiello, and the child study team at the high school have been working diligently to be ready for the, the beginning of school. And in your individual situation, I'm, I'm not on your child's child study team, so I can't discuss it or address it, um, but they will make sure that everything's in place for your child. And if you have a question about your, um, your own child, I encourage you to reach out to your child study team. Yeah, that's what I was gonna suggest, Mrs. Farrell. What you should be doing, uh, besides your discussion here tonight, obviously, is to reach out for Helen Doyle or your or your child study team and get those answers before the first day of, of school. Thank you. I've spoken with the case manager already, and um, this plan wasn't put into place just yet. Um, we okay. were planning on going back at that time. Right. I just yeah. have one more question about paraprofessionals and one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals. How will that be dealt with? So again, I think that it's going to be on an individual basis based on the IEP. And I encourage you to reach out to either the child study team or Mrs. Doyle Marino, because I think it's going to look different um, for individual students, especially in the virtual environment. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. I, I'm just looking at that. what time you put your question in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we've already talked about the seven and eight periods, virtually and in person. Thank you for acknowledging this work. Again, we've had hundreds of people on these task force. Our team um, has been tireless. The board has been tireless. So thank you for acknowledging that. We, we do appreciate that. Um, the high school schedule has to be this way virtually in order to go to work when returning in person. 45 minutes of live lesson, teacher once a week. Can you explain how and when the teacher can give extra time or support on screen? So extra time and support on screen at the secondary level for children that need help, Mr. Bain. Yeah, so uh, going back, and let me just pull up the schedule, we'll get the timing exactly right. It's 122 to 253 teachers are available for on screen every day um, for additional support um, in the hybrid. And the goal of the rotating uh, schedule is to get students as close to in the building twice a week as possible. So it's not once a week, but 
Uh, you know, we looked at very, many different models and splitting it up into, into fourths and to looking at, you know, a similar AB kind of model. And what we found to be the safest for capacity was to break into thirds and to keep the rotation going um, in order to get students in twice a week, um, every two out of three weeks. And, and we're really trying to maximize that with our capacity issues. Thank you. Um, and and I think that this is another really good suggestion and idea just to bring forward. Um, currently for our some of our special needs students, right? Because their goals are specific and not necessarily grade level specific, but goal specific. Um, there's printing out of materials or um, you know, printing out of packets, is it possible to provide books or workbooks? Just something to look at, um, Kent and Janine, as we're looking for providing materials. I think that that's, that's definitely a, a valid point. It's very challenging. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, so, so again, they're not going to be teachers in childcare. There won't be tutors. It'll be a safe space for your child to do the virtual learning. They won't be doing instruction. And for a final time, everything will be posted and available to the entire community, the parental community. As we typically do, we will send it to all families. We'll make it available to all families. There's not a, a limit. And as always, you'll have email instructions on how to complete um, the requirements for emergency child care. Um, and this is another one that comes up a lot. Thank you, uh, Ms. Summers. So an opportunity for high school students to help with emergency child care and virtual learning if their schedules allow them. So the positions in um, child care are posted and people will apply um, for those positions. Um, that's the first thing. Um, and we've already, just since the letter went out on Friday, we've already gotten a lot of people applying through, there's no position, and yet we've somehow had people sending their resume, which I appreciate, it'll make it go a lot faster. We've also had families um, at the elementary level reaching out to high school students um, to provide to that tutoring or childcare or picking up or dropping off I would only say um, my constant answer. I think it's wonderful. I think it, if there's if it allows them to help, it's great. If it allows the families um, to help, it's great. Please try and remember the cohort. One of the things and the reasons that we are cohorting students is because of the, the contact. We are trying as best as we can to limit contact and make sure that, um, again, as best as we can, that, that people are protected, right? We'll see in the daily screening if that if that's breached. But in the early models, you, you had um, multiple high school students working with multiple families and kind of creating lists. I would encourage you, if you can do this, to have consistent help, if possible. It'll help the, the high school families and the high school students with the contact, as well as our elementary. But it's a great idea if we can figure out how to make that work. Uh, Barbara Hirsch would like to make a statement. Please unmute and tell us your address. Um, and we're all listening. Barbara, are you still with us? It was just a minute ago, so I hope so. Let's give her a minute to unmute. Okay. Or, or let's come back to her. All right, Barbara, if you can hear us, unmute um, and let us know that you're here. I am going to keep going. Up, oh, some people still want to have the um, the um, digital copy to complete assignments. <laughs> um, let's see. So, you know, when you say there'll be no help if they have a question or need it, I, I would encourage you. You know, yes, they'll have help from their teacher because they're going to be online virtually with their teacher. If there if there is a question that's you know specific during a pre-recorded lesson or that, of course they can ask a question. But I just want to make sure that you know we're we're understanding that we're not providing teachers in the child care to teach instruction. All right, there is a difference. 
And again, I, I did answer about the paraprofessionals. It's individual. It's based on um, IEP and student need. Um, I see Mrs. Doyle Marino. I don't know if you if you have anything to add to that. You can just shake yes or no. You don't have to unmute if you. It's fine. Uh, they are based on individual needs and the rationale are outlined in each student's IEP, Dr. Glazer. I also want to note that IEPs are written for in-person instruction and our CST, our related service providers, our, our power professionals, we are all working on to help our students in a remote setting. So thank you. So Barbara Hirsch, I see that you're she sure. said she had trouble unmuting, so right. I'm trying, I'm trying to call her. Star six. If she's okay. on her phone, she has to hit star six. Star six, Barbara Hirsch, if you're trying to unmute on your phone. Yeah, and, I, and I've called her also, so we'll see if she gets back to us. And again, we've already talked about the plan to send books home. Um, and I, I think that says reading level books, Janine, like we did last year with the book baggies, the pick up and drop off. Would that be at the same time as the other home learning materials? Yeah, we're still working through that also. We, um, we're going to be utilizing RAS Kids again, which are those di digital level texts and epics. So we're going to be utilizing a lot of digital texts and still working out the plans for um, getting those leveled books home as well. Mrs. Ballou, you have something else? Mrs. Blue, you've asked to be heard. Are you are you available? We need to be careful, according to our attorney. We also need to be careful of our special ed discussions. I know we all know that, but um, we we cannot mention names. We all know that. Absolutely, I have a very um, general question in regard to how the paraprofessionals are being utilized in the virtual setting, without mentioning individuals without mentioning IEPs, what I, I thought that, that Mrs. Doyle Marino just answered that, but I, it, well no, no really. <laughs> are are they working? I know they're being paid, so what are they doing is my question. So all of our staff was paid in the spring by law and anybody that's working is going to be working. I, I don't, I'm not understand. Are you asking if the paraprofessionals are continuing in their role or are you asking what their role is? Because their role has a job description. So I, I guess we're confused. I, I'm sorry. I under, thank you, Dr. Glazer. Yes, I understand that their role is specific for whatever position they happen to be in. My question is a more general one. Um, are paraprofessionals being utilized moving forward in the virtual setting because I'm sure their jobs are all protected. So um, if they are all going to be working moving forward, should we expect them to be working moving forward? So, you know, at the risk of causing a panic, nobody's job is protected per se. People are contracted, number one. And again, as I heard Mrs. Doyle Marino say, they're, they're going to be used based on the IEP. So again, I don't know what, I think every paraprofessional situation is gonna be different. We do intend to utilize them to support students. Um, it does require devices for those paraprofessionals to be working with individual students. And, and I'm gonna say to start, um, if there's not a device, the priority has to be for the students. I don't know if there's anything else to add, Mrs. Doyle Marino, or if I missed anything. I, and I don't think, you know, other than the general discussion that we're having, we're not going to get into what, what the teachers or paraprofessionals are going to be doing come September 8th, but they will be on board working as everybody else in the district. Okay. Um, I Definitely, I definitely appreciate those answers. Thank you very much. I, I guess my general question was, are the paraprofessionals working moving forward as a whole? Or from what you're saying is there me button, you can't give me a, an answer on that. I can't tell you if your child is going to have his paraprofessional. Oh, no, I'm not your child. 
Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Blue. Yes, they will be working like the rest of our staff, September the eighth, in a different aspect than what we might have been used to in the past. But they will be there, and and they will be accountable like the rest of our staff. Okay, I was just asking because that was definitely I not the spring. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank I see. You. Barbara, I see Barbara Hirsch is on. Are you there, Barbara? Yes, I am. And can you hear me? Of you, but go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Barbara Hirsch, four seven seven Washington Avenue. Um, I just want to make a statement. Um, I worked for the school district for forty two years, and I'm very proud of it. I've always been proud of the leadership in this district. And let me tell you what I heard tonight is just unbelievable. I am now working at the college level. I am working with many other districts. We are lucky we live in Nutley. We have a wonderful board. I wanna commend all the members of the Board of Education. Dr. Glazer for her leadership, Kent Banya, Janine, and all the staff. What a wonder. Now, our governor keeps saying one size doesn't fit all, and it doesn't. I think with all of the restraints provided by the state of New Jersey, not just the governor, but the Department of Health, plus the local agencies, your district, my district, has just gone so beyond. They are doing the very best they can for your children. And I see other districts, neighboring districts, districts that are always in the paper for being acclaimed for one thing or another, we're lucky. So yes, it's not going to be without problems. It's not gonna solve everyone's problem. Just the idea that Dr. Glazer and the board are looking at providing childcare other districts are not doing that. So please, just be very grateful. And you know, it seems ironic to me, my mentor and the person that set me on the road to being a minister in this district, to lose him tonight had a lot of meaning for me. And he, I, was, I knew he was very sick and he wasn't doing well, Dr. Padul. But be grateful, folks. I've lived in Nutley all my life. I'm a graduate of Nutley High School, of Washington School. You have the best. So yes, there are gonna be problems, but just work with your district. They are the best. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, That's, that, thank you Barbara. That's why we saved you to her near the end. And, <laughs> and Helen, Helen Doyle, I expect you to come back in 10 years and make that same type of statement. <laughs> Those Thank, are you. Big to fill, Thank, you, Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad you were able to unmute. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. All right. Thank Let's, you. I'm going to scroll back up. Um, okay. Just to be clear, when, when we do reopen um, with the, the kindergarten, pre-K, self-contained special ed, and the English language learners, we will be following the hybrid model. It's our hope for outcome that we'll be able to add additional time. But to start, we're just looking to transition the children in with the staff and make sure that we're able to provide them with opportunities to, to be comfortable in the classroom. It's gonna be a hybrid model to start and we'll continue to phase in and grow. That hasn't changed. Um, and we're thrilled to take your feedback, even if, believe it or not, we're all still smiling. I can't, yeah. <laughs> there's still 100 people here listening and 400 on the live stream. We appreciate you. We appreciate you all. And thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ballou, not a specific pair of in regards to my neighboring districts have had their pairs involved in the virtual platform. Nutley is not. I was asking for clarification. Okay. And again, I think we've answered you the best that we can for tonight. Thank you for seconding Barbara's comments. Yes, I, I will say this out loud, loud. Barbara, I hope you're still listening. Barbara Hirsch, Class Act, all in capital letters. And I think that um, you have a lot of ends on this call because now all the comments are about you and not about virtual learning. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and again, 
This model continues to grow. I'm afraid to say this up. Oh, I started to say, and another one. Um, let's see, if we're not comfortable to have our self-constained students begin and sign them up for hybrid, can we still change that to virtual? You can still change that now. The um, portal is open until Friday, and then the directions for how to fall back or go forward are still, still there. Um, and yes, Linda Bousset and Deborah Marchese, 100%, it's all true. Thank you, thank you for commenting. Um, I am going to, you're gonna see me look away. Believe it or not, I have a different screen for the live streaming comments. And thank you, Anthony. We have a lot of people helping us behind the scenes tonight to make it go faster. So thank you, Anthony, for typing um, a lot of the similar questions into this chat so I can see them while I'm looking um, out at our um, participants. I just want to scroll through to make sure on YouTube I'm not missing anything. And thank you to some of our board members who've been able to answer the questions offline. Yeah, I, I know that our board members are out there being very involved, and I appreciate that from most of our board members. If, the, if anybody, um, Charlie, maybe the board has a question while I'm just reading through to make sure we didn't miss, because we had another. No, um, I, I, I haven't gotten any more from the board, but it's open. But I think we're pretty good with the board. It's been um, it's been enlightening listening to our our residents. I think that we've done a pretty good job here. Okay, if there are no more, if there are no further well, questions. Give me a second. Believe it or not, you you'd be surprised. We started with 60 pre pre sent questions. Um, as I'm scrolling through, Charlie, just to make sure I'm reading number 172. Oh, oh. Sure uh, I I text or emails. Yep. And we will answer um, as best as we can. Um, again. The child care is for, um, you might need to mute. I don't know who's still open, but um, the child care is emergency child care. Um, there will be a process for you to access that if you're required to return to work and you have no other options at home. Um, again, speech OTPT, um, virtual, because the telehealth works, if not for your individual child, um, that's where we'll be doing those um, assessments in September, and perhaps um, your child will have a different plan. Kindergartens, I think we answered this. I'm sorry, I'm trying to go between the Meet Chat and the YouTube, so. And I think um, the, I think the, um, the uh, emergency care is gonna be another full discussion rather than tonight because it's, it's it's, it's an ongoing process that we need to be more familiar with ourselves. Well, Charlie, in all honesty, it's fairly straightforward. We, we are going to be housing it at Washington School because that's where we can control the temperature and make sure that it's an appropriate space for everybody to be safe. We know that there'll be breakfast and lunch provided uh -huh. in outdoor spaces. Um, and we know uh -huh. that it will be virtual learning. I, and I appreciate that. But I, I'm speaking for the board. I don't think our board has been fully assessed of everything that we want to talk about with that, such as the cost, such as what we're. Oh, what we, haven't we're talked, we, haven't, we aren't even there yet. Okay, so that's uh, so why I don't think we should be discussing that tonight, personally. Um, so the question is what good is emergency child care if they won't okay. help with learning? And, and here's the thing, you're gonna have your teacher on the, on the Chromebook. Your teacher is providing that virtual learning. We're providing a safe space um, so that the parents that need to return to work can return to work. We're gonna make sure that all the children that are in that childcare program are taken care of, are fed, are, um, in a safe space so that their parents who need to work are able to um, work and their child can be educated. You do have teachers, those teachers are just virtual. Um, class supply lists, just one last time, Janine. 
Um, there won't be supply lists. This is one of those hard things where you close your eyes and you think of buying that first day of school outfit, which you could wear on Google Meet, just to say I have one. Um, but, you know, that whole Staples circular where you're looking at the 10 cent folders and a different color binder for every class, definitely going to look different. So, Janine, do you want to just one more time go through the um, what we're looking at for supplies? Yeah, um, we met with the elementary principals. They're going to be sharing supply lists in the coming days, um, but it may look more like um, some dry erase markers. Part of what we're sending home in the outlearning kit are um, plastic page protectors. They're called communicators, but you might know them to be page protectors um, that you can put different um, graphic organizers in and write with dry erase markers so children may be asked to hold up their answers in front of the screen or share something that way. So the supply list is just going to look different. Um, of course, you're going to have pencils and things like that to work in workbooks, um, markers, traditional things like that, scissors, um, but it, it will just look different than it has in the past. Thank you. Um, and with the hands-on, the question is again at child care. Again, I, I think that our, our point is for you to be mindful it's not a teacher. It's not any different than if you hired a caregiver to be at home to make sure your child was safe and fed while you were at work. It will not be a teacher supervising your child, but if your caregiver is able to answer a question, if your caregiver is able to help, um, you know, get on with the Google Meet, that won't be any different than in what we're planning to offer. And amazingly enough, at four minutes to nine, we have asked, we have asked and answered the questions that were provided in advance and were provided in the chat, Mr. Kaczynski. Thank you very much, Dr. Glazer. Um, moving forward, my board members, um, I, Mr. DePizzo, are you here? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm just checking in. Um, we're gonna move forward with our resolutions. Academic resolution, Mrs. Quirk, will you take that resolution, please? Yes, Mr. President, I move academic resolution number one is written. Second. Well, discussion. Roll call, Mr. Mr. DeFisa, please. Mr. Carnicella. He's, he's excused. Mr. Danchek Martin. She's excused. Mr. DeMeo. Mr. DeMeo. I see him. Yep. He's in trouble. Yes. Mr. Ferrara. Yes. 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 Ms. Quirk. Mrs. Quirk. Yes. Mr. Riley. Yes. Mr. Scalera. Yes. Ms. Zarrow. Yes. Mr. Krasinski. Yes. Thank you. Mrs. Mrs. Quirk, will you take policy resolution, please? Uh, yes, Mr. President, I move policy resolution number one is written. I'm sorry, no, I'm, it was my, my fault, but go ahead. I meant to tell you, Zara, but um, it's been a long night. The, the, both okay. of you, I'm sorry, both of you work very hard on the policy committee. I appreciate that. So it, it doesn't, if you want to take half and Eric Zara takes half, we'll be fine. <laughs> Terry, you moved it. I'll second it. And I will just All say, right. I'll just say that. We put a lot of time and effort into these policies. Um, nothing was overlooked. Nothing was not looked into. We checked every T, dotted every I. So, um, yeah. And we appreciate your hard work. Thank you very much. We got a first and a second discussion. Roll call, Mr. DeBeza, please. Mr. DeMeo. He said yes in the, in the chat. Mr. Ferrara. Yes. Mrs. Quirk. Yes. Mr. Riley. Yes. Mr. Scalera. Yes. Ms. Zaro. Yes. Mr. Kaczynski. Yes. In this section, we allow questions or comments on all school-related matters. 
Our regulations allow 30 minutes for these communications. Again, each person should be limited to three minutes. We ask you to try to stay within this requirement. Speakers may speak more than once, only after all others wishing to speak on a topic have been heard. As I stated earlier, all statements will be directed to me as the chairperson. No one may address board members individually. Please be reminded that if your statement is too lengthy, abusive, obscene, irrelevant, or redundant, your participation may be terminated. Please remember to state your name and address each and every time you address the board. Does anyone have anything to say now about school-related matters? Thank you very much. I'll hear from the I'll hear from the German. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you. All eyes in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, you. Aye. Thank you very much, citizens and board members. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.